Welcome to episode 86 of Taste My Game Face. I am your host, Zizi Adiyama, joined today by Wayne James. Hello. And Joe Knight. Hello, it's been a while. Yeah, it has been a little while. Oh, yeah. And a really important thing happened in that little while, which we haven't mentioned on the podcast, or at least a really important thing for me and you, which is... Our shared got, passion. Our shared passion, which was we got to actually see the cyberpunk gameplay that had been talked about from E3 by a lot of the gaming media press types. And uh, it was fucked up good. Did me in, man. <laughs> like, it fully did me in. Like, what, like, just shy of an hour's worth of gameplay. And uh, I kind of looked at it and I was like, oh shit, am I actually going to finally get the. Uh, what the hell was the fucking name of the game, actually? I've forgotten. You're not going to know, are you, Joe? Well, no, when you say, what's the name of the game? You do this all the time. You look at me like I know what you're you thinking. Know. Yeah, but we don't okay, know. Let's, yeah, let's, we need more let's, than that. Let's rattle out some cyberpunk times. <laughs> Deus Ex? No, the other one. The other one? Not Deus Ex. Syndicate. <laughs> Syndicate. <laughs> The Starbreeze, the Starbreeze remake of Syndicate Two, yeah, to be yeah. precise. So, so the Starbreeze remake of Syndicate Two, which was just titled Syndicate, we, I, I felt like watching that, I was gonna finally get that game as I wanted it. I not shit. Oh, it's not shit. It's well, got no, huge no, no. problems, but like it's um. It's a diff- oh, this is a good way to start a contemporary video. Do you know that really important thing where we saw that really new footage for that brand new game? Let's talk about Syndicate. <laughs> it came because, out years ago. Because no one played it. Yeah, I know. Um, but I, I don't know. Like, I think Syndicate is enjoyable. I, I got something out of it. it. Interestingly enough, like dubstep was a factor in that. Mm-hmm. Also, you know, like it was, at the, it was the peak of that. It was like, oh, what if Squillex did the music? And now, somehow it panned out. And that panned out, actually. Which was like, weird. Like, yeah. not what I expected in those Oh, he's much better when he's got a brief. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And normally that brief these days is... It's Justin Bieber. Yep. Who, who fucking knew? Anyway, so, like, there are there are distinct hints of... of um, I've forgotten the name of it again so quickly. Syndicate. How have I managed that? There are distinct hints of Syndicate going on in that gameplay, which made me really happy. But also... It's just so thoroughly steeped in like so many staples of cyberpunk that like I saw it and I was like, this looks delicious. I love this genre. I love it more than possibly any other genre that I'm ever involved in. Why am I not just doing this more? So I went and watched Dread. It was a solid choice. Uh, I mean, I think it's really important that we lock this down though, actually at this point. Yeah. Like when we like cyberpunk, you know, we like all like cyberpunk, we like it all its flavours, but there's a particular kind of cyberpunk, and that's this kind of 80s cyberpunk. This isn't your neo leather jacket vibe, you know? It's not that. It's something quite it's something quite different. It's something more anarcho punk. Should we actually explain what cyberpunk is? Yeah, I think you could that might be not be something that's clear. You, you, you're lost, are you, Wayne? <laughs> well, no, I, like I've heard the phrase cyberpunk used to describe a lot of things, and I'm sure that a lot of the time it's simply so that someone well, can tag something that they're not entirely sure about. Well, William Gibson wrote a series of books called The Sprawl um, in the kind of mid to late 80s. Like uh, the first big release, he wrote a short story collection uh, beforehand, but the first book, Neuromancer, came out in 1984, best year. As we all know, Wayne cracking agrees. Year. Cracking year. Yeah, cracking year. And um, I wasn't there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you missed out. You missed out. I had, how many days did I have of that? 14? Uh, yeah, it was fucking good 14 days. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so, 14. <laughs> so he, his books were about like, they, they were very, prof- ooh, very prophetic. Yeah, they kind of had a, a kind of, way of like looking at the future and predicting kind of everything that would happen. Yeah. He predicted the internet, you know, like it, cause of, I guess he's he was very, very, he's got a very different version of it though. But yeah, yeah. But his version of the internet inspired the matrix. As in a matter fact, of fact, fact, it's, it's called, called the, the matrix. matrix. 
Thank it, you, they're Wayne. All, they're also, likewise in it, yeah, um, Joe's just been handed a tissue for the drink that he spilled. Yeah, for those audio, audio listeners, because I was too excited about cyberpunk. Um, so, like, similarly, it came up, like, in the book are sort of ideas that have been turned into companies, words like uh, Microsofts, which are how people can do that thing that you might have seen in The Matrix, if you've seen that film, where people, like, instantly put information in their head. Um, and the whole idea of viruses was first invented there. Like he came up with the idea of a computer virus and hacking using computer viruses. So it's, it's really steeped in like a sort of interconnected world that's connected, um, and hackable via so the internet. What I'm not getting here is the difference between cyberpunk and sci-fi. So the flip to this is that at the same time you have an and it's it's a it is just a small little section of sci-fi, but it's it's um, a sort of not quite post-apocalyptic future. It's that everything's fallen apart in a in a kind of grand industrialized sort of way, so that you've got like this expanding difference between the rich and poor that creates like the the underclass that's like just trying to crawl through and survive and take all of the drugs and run as many schemes as they can. So the basically it's what's happening now is... My cool. reference <laughs> points are like Blade Runner and Midgar. Yeah, Midgar is... So, uh, so what the fuck is Midgar? Uh, Final Fantasy chat, I don't know. Okay, don't worry enough. about it, Princess, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, I feel like Don't Worry About It Princess is like completely counter to talking about Final Fantasy. Like surely in that scenario, the princess should be worrying. Well, no, like she like she's a female character in a Final Fantasy oh, you're game. Right. So Fair that's, that's not how that pans out, unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, like it is, it's definitely Blade Runner or the book that it was based on, Under a Dream of Electric Sheep, is really quite cyberpunk but missing some of the aspects of punk missing some of the anarcho sentiment the fuck the system like everything is falling apart and you are going to a spiral into madness in the middle of that and maybe somehow come up on top which is at the heart of like a deus ex which is at the heart of like the old and the new syndicates and which has kind of crept more and more in subtle ways into other games like i think one of the things about mirror's edge is that it is cyberpunk but in a subtle way it isn't quite so overtly like black leather coats and neon but the themes that it's about are inherently cyberpunk and also so is the idea of emerging ai and I think that that is something that we've seen woven through the themes of a lot of these games as well. And I am always quite excited by. So can I then, having cleared up what cyberpunk means to you guys, can I drag us for a second onto the trailer itself? I've mm -hmm. not seen it. So what about it evokes these feelings for you? Oh, it's absolutely everything. So the it's like there's a look. It's fucking neon super neon everything's glowing and buzzing the characters are all kind of like they've all got this kind of like punk aesthetic like little bits of wiring like dangling off the side of their head and where they've had a chip bomber jackets. In. yeah bomber <laughs> jackets or like dungarees with no top on like mohawks stuff like that like it's a it's got very kind of judge dread kind yeah, of because it's not vibe. because they're all different flavors of cyberpunk and uh, some of them are more slick and this one's like way more aggro. It feels way more eighties cyberpunk, like to its core. And like one of the particular things that's really interesting about it in terms of what they showed, like who knows whether they'll succeed in doing this or not, but the crowds in the world, you don't see very many characters looking at all similar. Everybody's trying to have a distinct fucking outrageous style. And there are like shit loads of people populating the streets in that world. And they all look fucking cool as hell and uh, different. And if you imagine like, cause taking CD product, Project Red's last game, The Witcher, and like how beautiful and full of verdant fields, but very sparse characters like left around. Imagine if you like took that game and squeezed it into a little box and then made it vertical. So everyone's living in these high rises that are like super huge mega towers, you know, corporations like existing in the penthouses on top of them, controlling the traffic of like new microchips and skill sets and the drugs cartels and balancing those out against each other inside these mega structures. Like, it's just phenomenal. Like what the, the achievement that they've done is amazing. And the way, 
that your character kind of seems to be able to interact with the world is also really good. Like there's a lot, uh, your character gets called out by name and by a lot of people that you're, as you're walking through the world, as you walk through the world, the, um, the advertisements on the side of a building will change to address your character directly because they know who you are because you're a location chip when you're walking past, like stuff like that. They, they, they seem like small little touches, but they're big kind of cyberpunk conceptual like staples that have just been nailed. Yeah, it's it's like the the most sort of urban imagining of a, of a future that you could have. Like, it's not about sort of designing spaces so that people can easily move through. It's not like about big planning. It's about just cramming everyone in as tight as possible and watching them all sort of try and work out how to exist together. And all of them wanting to carve not just physical space for themselves, but like mental and style space for themselves within that. And it seems to be doing that really, really, really well. Now, of course, this is super early footage. And like it, as much as it's excited us by the things that are suggested in it, like I think that there are a lot of things that it may not deliver on. But the fundamental of what it's saying is we are going to make a game that's very, very cyberpunk. And we're going to make it, I mean, it's the name, right? Yeah, I was going to say, I hope so. <laughs> oh, it would be so good though if it was just like on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and we're going to and we're gonna do good writing with that. We're going to write to that. And like that sort of approach. And the, th- and the thing that's required there as well with Cyberpunk is that it has to be about mature themes. It has to be about like sex and violence and drugs and trying to but, somehow maintain being a reasonable human like torn between all of those things but cyberpunk like innately also like is about all of those themes but those are themes that we get in like a lot of things they're the same themes as you get in like a grand theft auto but one of the really important things about like cyberpunk as a genre is it's about the instant disposability of any sort of commodity of anything so you know your sex drugs and money uh things that can just that they're there one minute gone the next everything's disposable you know you're just drinking red bulls and eating ramen all day like that's that's what you do when you're a cyberpunk man you know like there's, there's nothing a cyberpunk man yeah <laughs> i love it i love it so um, i that one like so we've got a lot of feeling i understand the mood but how much it was a gameplay trailer right yeah so what do we understand of the gameplay quite a lot from what they showed yeah there's um so it's quite hard to kind of pin the combat system down. So first and foremost, it's a first person shooter, right? right? So, or, I mean, yes. And I mean, like it's, it's, it's more, an immersive sim more, a uh, more than a shooter, I think. Okay. I think well, it's well, I mean, more like, Deus Ex I, yeah, than I think Call like of Duty. Talking about mechanics though, like I think you could also get away with saying that mechanically Deus Ex is a first person shooter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, um, and that's what, that's kind of where I'm going with it. And I think that, um, I mean, it's got some. It's it's got some interesting things. Like you shoot at an enemy. Obviously, this game is based on a. It's based on a pen and paper RPG called Cyberpunk twenty twenty. Yeah, and that. Um, so when you're shooting at an enemy, there are like numbers coming out of them, showing you like the damage and stuff. Interestingly, though, in the pen and paper RPG, the the combat that happens if you get into a shootout, it isn't like that. It's it's way more frenetic. It is if someone fires a gun, someone's probably going to fucking die. Like you don't get that sort of uh, wearing people down thing that you get in Dungeons and Dragons. Like the the combat is supposed to be more realistic, I suppose, but more ghost in a shell realistic. Like guns that fire too many bullets too quickly and shit goes awry real fucking fast if you're not in control of the situation. But yeah, but the game looks to be geared more to being a shooter that people who maybe aren't so incredibly proficient in shooters are capable of playing and enjoying. And there's lots of ways to modify that as well for your experience. Like in the gameplay like demo that we saw, there was a, and I was quite happy with this. There's a lot of taking drugs. So you get, you'll pull a little inhaler out of your pocket. You'll take one big like, and it's got really good sound design. So your character's like, oh, fuck. And then, like, and then like all of a sudden everything's slowed down. 
Yeah, and, so and, the, and you're like, and you're and you're like shooting away, getting like better critical hit damage and stuff like that. I, I mean, that's gorgeous for two reasons. First of all, that that is a mod that uh, I, I can't remember exactly what it's called in the nomenclature of the world, but that's something that exists in the 2020 game that used to be like a chip that um, could be installed in a person where they would experience life in slow motion all of the time, and they thought, how could we make this make gameplay sense? We wouldn't want <laughs> the whole game to play out in slow motion so we create this uh, um, inhaler for it which is straight from the Dread movie yeah. where the drug is called slow-mo and it is one of the most beautiful things to watch on screen and they spent loads of time trying to work out how to make incredibly quick gory fights look so abstracted that they were beautiful so they slowed things down to 1% of normal speed and they were like right let's smack a drug on that and we can have that happen on screen so double win yeah and all this combat as it's playing out obviously is like super brutal and super violent like bits of the walls flying away like there's a bit where you sneak up on a guy who's trying to harvest kind of mods out of like a corpse and you like grab him by the head stick him in like stick him in a vat of water and shoot him you know, like a point blank range to muffle the shot of the gun. I'm just going to caveat that. It's not a corpse. That person's alive. Uh, that's true, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's kind of... <laughs> so it's even more fucked up. I assume it was to be... Corpse a corpse to be. Corpsified <laughs> soon. Um, Aren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. Uh, but yeah, so... Um, but that's not the only like that's not the only way you're engaging with the world. So you've also got... One of the things that I think is really interesting, it's got a very kind of dynamic conversation system by the looks of it. So if you can imagine you're having that conversation in a video game and you're making lots of choices on your dialogue and, you know, it's stiff line, stiff line, stiff line going through. Then when you get to the end of the dialogue, you know, you're either fighting or they're giving you what you want, right? That's kind of like often how it goes in those games. In this one, the animations and stuff, it's like that people are having a chat. And then if people are saying the wrong thing, people are like, got these animations that are there for this, where people are like starting to pull guns out and point them at each other, but you're still chatting. You're still like, oh man, chill it out. Like put the guns, oh, and the options are there, which is like, blow them away now. <laughs> yeah, like that's always there. The, the option to just blow them the fuck away, like is always present yeah like you can just you can just be like oh, okay today that's it you know you could be chilling something out and then all of a sudden be like nah <laughs> nah this is our hand now boom boom boom, boom. Like- so the specific scenario here and like and i really do recommend you watch it um and apparently from hearing games press talk about it it could play out in a few different ways but the specific scenario is you have gone into a um a sort of gang base um, to make a trade for um, a specific bit of military equipment that they've stolen, right? Um, and you've you've been given money by some government suits types to make the trade with them to take it back. And you, uh, one of them ends up freaking out, uh, wondering where the fuck you've come from, why the hell you've got that money, and or actually not wondering why you've got that money, wondering if you've got that money. And then you are in a situation where you can start fighting out, you can make the trade with them, or it turns out that the chip that you're going to give them with the money on also has a virus on it. If you found out about that, you can warn them and like just make the trade and walk out. Now, the version we see is not knowing about it, making the trade, it fucking them up, then them, then them gunning for you, right? But... This sort of dynamic dialogue system and possible different tributaries of how the scenario can play out is something I would be super trepidatious about normally. I would look at that and I'd go, these guys have a ridiculous idea of what they're going to pull off. Like, this is going to be a one-time thing that happened in the game and wait, and the rest of the time it's going to be way more linear. The thing is, though, I've, seen, I've played The Witcher 3 and I was frankly astonished at multiple times at how successful CD Projekt were at pulling this off. Now, I am still very aware that they are setting the bar really high for them to actually manage to hit. But I feel like if there's any game development studio at the moment that's capable of approaching that, it's them. And also, even if they don't make it that far, it's going to be so cyberpunk that I'm not really sure I'll care that much. So, you know, 
<laughs> it looks good. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a good video game. Um, I couldn't be more excited for Cyberpunk. So both of us decided to read Neuromancer. Yeah, that's how excited we are. We've been like, oh, like I, th- I was thinking to myself, oh, do you know what? Do you know what? I've never read, and I mean read, I've never read Akira. And I was like, oh, maybe oh, I should yeah, read Akira. Maybe that's something that I should do whilst I'm on this cyberpunk thing. I've never read Ghost in the Shell. I should maybe do that. I've seen them. I've seen. I mean, I, actually, I did. I I also watched Akira recently. After oh, that, did you watch Dread? Watched Akira. Started started reading um um Neuromancer. Um, I have been. What was the other one I was thinking of picking up? Oh, it's escaped me. But anyway, all of the cyberpunk. Yeah, right now. Because to be honest, I want cyberpunk <laughs> oh, that was now. It. You know, you know what would carbon. Yes. Uh, Netflix series. It's a good book as well. Well, they both got strengths and weaknesses. I was thinking about getting back into that series. Um, there's a whole sort of interesting exploration of not just what it is to be at the bottom end of like the technological pile there. Like as every, as technology gets better, the rich man should do better and better for themselves and they leave the poor behind. Everybody's kind of stuck scrabbling in the dirt. That's where a lot of cyberpunk spends most of its time. The nice thing about that particular series is they spend a lot of time with the people at the top as well. And you get to see how the same scenario fucks them up in a completely different way. The That's z- kind of delicious. 0.01%. Yeah, the 0.001%. <laughs> yeah, sure. Or the Mets, as they're called in that world. Oh, okay. Um, which is short for Methuselahs, people that live forever, uh, okay. which I kind of like. So, yeah. Cyberpunk's great. Everyone should be about it. Get involved. <laughs> Buy a leather jacket and some sunglasses. And for, I mean, hang 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 out in Docklands <laughs> with your sunglasses on. Should I should I get a bomber jacket? Is is it too late? Would I would I look like an idiot or like a brilliant man? I, I don't think know. You could, I think you could. You've got the body shape for a bomber jacket. <laughs> you just need to get one with like some like I don't know some sort of sweet logo on the back of it. Something fluorescent. Yeah, or like a or like an animal, like a dolphin or something. Not. Not yeah, a scorpion, though. No, not a scorpion. No, definitely not. <laughs> but hey, um, I think that I've been doing that's not a cyberpunk, though, because video games have been happening besides this, it turns out, I don't know why, is um, having a go at the new Spider-Man game. Um, and Joe, just before recording, you told me that it's like managed to sell even better than God of War. Did yeah, like 3.3 3 3 million copies in three days. That's insane. Yeah, that's like the record-breaking Sony first-party title of all time, which they're on a roll with at the moment. They've yeah, already they smashed that this year with fucking... <laughs> like, their investors must be fucking <laughs> laughing their way to the <laughs> bank this year. Yeah, so I guess people really like Spider-Man. People love Spider-Man. He's everyone's hero, right? I mean, I'm not... I'm pretty keen on Spider-Man. Like, Spider-Man's the first, like, superhero that I gave a fuck about as, like, a tiny human. I was like... Cl- I thought climbing around all of the time was the best thing ever. And a superhero that does that is my favourite superhero, right? Yeah. Makes sense? I mean, you rock climb, maybe you didn't feel anything like that, Wayne. Well, I didn't at the time. (laughs) Um, But no, I mean, like, so Spider-Man was always really interesting to me. um, Just because... Like, he always seemed to be having such a shit time. <laughs> yeah, uh, his work-life balance is yeah, all fucked I, up. He's, he, just, he just never seemed, like, every so often he gets kind of into the whole sort of being a spider. And any, like, just the briefest moment of hubris, and it all goes to shit for him. And so I always found him quite an interesting character from that standpoint. <laughs> Balanced on the knife edge. Um, yeah, so I've barely played any of it. It plays really well. Like, incredibly well. They've managed to take the sort of Arkham combat system and, like, put it through a lens of a character that's supposed to be more acrobatic and, like, more dynamic and, you know, hell of a lot cheekier than Batman so that he's, like, saying brilliant quips whilst he's, like, flying through the air, beating the shit out of people and sticking them to walls. Really enjoyable, kicking someone up in the air and then they're close enough to a wall so you can just fire your web at them and just stick them there. That's fucking great, right? And I understand why people love the game with just that small amount of play. But there's a really specific thing that I wanted from it that it hasn't delivered on. Is it not as good as Titanfall's movement? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Oh, fucking hell. (laughs) It's the web swimming in Titanfall (laughs) Bat. You fucking nailed it, Joe. Is he? No, no, no. I'm let not me. A God love you, but like, it, 
It's, it, it is every time. <laughs> let, let, let me actually explain that, right? Because I'm not expecting it to be as good as Titan Falls movement because it's not the same movement. Right. Okay. But what I was hoping for and what I didn't get is actually feeling like I was in control of that movement and having to sort of judge the momentum a little bit. And like, you know, I fucking love Mirror's Edge as well. It's and tribes. It's that same thing. I wanted it to be more about like becoming a little bit becoming familiar and then and then expert at like maintaining momentum. Is and it, your and flow it, like stunted, do you feel, when you're playing? No, it? it's not at all. And that's, oh, okay. that's actually the problem. That it is so intent on making you feel capable and powerful that you don't need the skills to do that. And that actually goes for the combat as well. There's so, there's so much going on and it will execute it so easily and so well all of the time. And there's definitely a case where it's building on top of that. It starts off... It starts off with you being powerful and then it like just keeps ramping that up and up and up. But I kind of wanted that low level bit of just trying to find the momentum, making sure that when I was swinging between buildings, I didn't hit them. And if you hit them, you can just run up them and it's fine. And I know why they did that because that's exactly what most people want. But that's exactly what I don't want. Okay. Um, apart from that though, Apart from that really minor little <laughs> stupid me thing, the game the game is great, um, but I haven't got far enough into it to really get a feel of the sort of depth of the story. Like it's it, it opens with a big bang and like runs with that pretty hard, and I, I haven't got much further than that. I've got to like the lull uh, over the first uh, after the first bit of drama, and I'm I am interested in picking it up again. Um, I'm sure I will. I'm sure I'll get stuck into it. And if you are into Spider-Man and you want a good superhero game and you haven't had one since like Arkham City, then like this is probably the way to go. But it didn't quite give me what I wanted. Okay. Is it as gorgeous as it looks? Um, we'll have a look at her after the podcast, but yeah, it looks really stunning. Um, peculiarly enough, the thing that it reminds me most of is um, Mario Odyssey. Because well, that game is gorgeous. Exactly, but when you're in the when you're in the city in that game, like it feels the scale of it is like really appreciable, and yeah, they managed to they managed to pull that off really credibly. What well, and like it's that times ten, like as it should be. Um, so yeah, like it it looks fucking great. I just hope they put on a concert for the Spider Man because <laughs> that was the best bit about that city level. <laughs> I concur. I concur. But hey, um. Anyway, like I, d I actually don't have very much to say about it because I barely played it. I'm also I will say right now to people listening to this podcast is that the, when uh, when Alan swings back in, mm -hmm. it's going to be Spider Man all the time for a little while, <laughs> and I'm sure that'll be like the next one or so. So you can play a little bit more and have yeah, it out. Yeah, I know. I like. I mean, that's that's a significant part of why I started playing it was that I wanted to be able to have that conversation with Alan. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, we, we, we know he loves him some Spider-Man. He does. It'll be interesting to hear what he has to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, But Wayne, you have been playing another game that is a favorite of the podcast. I have. For some of the podcast anyway. Um, So how <laughs> has getting to a game that's only one year old now? Yeah, been? I know. I know I'm catching up. Um, So last year, um, you guys talked um, very fondly of Hellblade Senua Sacrifice. Not all of us, Wayne. <laughs> you, you you did talk I fondly did talk about, about it. I did talk fondly about you, it. Like, not, not that your conclusion wasn't fond, but you talked <laughs> fondly about it. I did. Um, so, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, and like I put out on the Twitter as well. Um, so occasionally I do st stick stuff on there. Mm -hmm. That It was on Steam Sale a couple of weekends ago. So I was like, excellent. Let's get involved. Let's see what all the fuss was about. Um, so I downloaded it. Uh, it was like twelve quid. Downloaded it overnight. Twelve pounds. Yeah, I know. Ridiculous. Oh fucking hell! That's great. Yeah. Um, stuck it on the next day. Played it for about an hour, and then put it like went. Uh, put so, it down. I, I, I'll, I'll okay, 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 I'll get okay. that. I'll get that. <laughs> because well, I was just gonna say that I found the opening quite compelling. Ah, no, no. They're actually quite a long way from compelling. And that may be because my what I expected to experience was coloured by Our conversation. what I was hearing about it. Um, the, the, the very opening is quite compelling. 
because I mean, like, we won't go too much into the sort of like details of what it does because there's a whole podcast on it. But you know, it's this exploration of like psychosis, but set in the sort of Norse mythology around like the Orkney Isles, and it's got like so it's got all of the references to the um, like Viking gods and stuff, um, and lots of the lore best around gods. that. It's very niche. Viking yeah. gods as well, which is good. It's good to see it not being fucking four and Loki. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a it is. It is. Um, but so, but like, so, like, Joe recommended to me that I should play it with headphones on, yeah. and it really is the shout because you've got it does say on the f- f- splash screen, but do take that seriously if you're picking it up and playing it for the first time. I mean, they it, they they did something in particular with recording the audio, which is they used. Um, like microphones that had sort of ear shapes on them to try so, and c- replicate like the oddness of yeah one of the yeah, few things i got from my music tech degree was the uh, the creation of binaural you actually stick them in something that's like you stick your microphones in something that has roughly the density of a head as well mm-hmm. so that the sort of like the sound feels like it's actually around you mm-hmm. when you're there it's um and it's really interesting and really compelling and it does like so it, it's really worth it. But yeah, so you get this bit and there's like the sort of voices going on in your head and this internal dialogue. And it's sending you this internal dialogue that's rattling on and you sort of do it and you're like, oh, this is kind of interesting. Like, I like what they're doing. I like the atmosphere and all the rest of it. And then you start playing the game and you're like, oh, um, what what is the game? So there's, a, there, there's an awful lot, uh, particularly in the start, of just running. And it's not often used like in as we expect from games nowadays to sort of like contextualize the environment so much. A lot like this, just like you're on a beach for four minutes and then you're on a bridge for four minutes and then you're just walking about rocks. And occasion- And then like one of the first problems that you get to, and this is by far the weakest bit of the entire thing. And I'm going in on all of this because I'm going to come out the other side if you didn't see that coming. <laughs> but the... um yeah it's these rune puzzles you come to doors and they're locked by runes and what you have to do is go and explore the environment to find that shape somewhere in the environment but it's kind of like a magic eye picture like it sort of pops out of like random elements of the scenery and sometimes there are things that look just like it that aren't good enough Mm -hmm. and there are other things it's it's maddening isn't it yeah it's just you feel you're just sort of trying to find bits of the environment that are the right shape from the right angle yeah it's it's stupid yeah but thematically brilliant (laughs) trying to look for some sort of sense in amongst a bunch of things that you can build your own personal narrative offers keys to unlock your further things i think i i found it interesting from that perspective maddening as a gameplay like i mean it definitely it definitely is an interesting concept and there are a few interesting concepts right, like, that don't necessarily hit from a gameplay sort of perspective. But that is the, the very worst one. I mean, and what you end up doing is walking around until that sign comes up on screen and then spin around until it just so happens to, to So, work. I mean, like, actually ca- camping out on those for a moment. Like, if, if you aren't... G- if the spiel that you're heading towards is not a revelation just on them, then I have to say, actually, the fact that they are maddening is a really important part of the experience. That is what he is trying to make you feel. That is the game. I, I've... Well, then that's the age-old question of whether or not video games being an arsehole for, uh, for artistic content is, is, is justification enough. <laughs> In this case, I feel that it 100% is, but it is a case-by-case basis. Yeah, I also think they overdo it in Hogwarts, yeah, actually. Yeah, I, I, I... Personally. Exactly. I think there's... I think... I think you're right. Like that idea is kind of cool, but there's there doesn't need to be like thirteen better. of them. Like yeah. three would be sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> and there are. I a, wouldn't have been pissed off by them if there were three, though. Oh uh, yeah. Oh, I don't know. Like I remember the third one, maybe the third one being particularly nasty. I remember spending a bunch of time standing on this ramp. I actually, I just looked one, looked a couple of them up online. I just got bored. Oh. And this is the thing: I disengaged. Mm. this is the worst okay, thing yeah, about yeah, yeah. it it wasn't it wasn't oh this is like the first time i saw it because it's a very small arena you're like oh this is an interesting puzzle and it's kind of difficult and all the rest of it but it just kind of gets bullshit 
Mm-hmm. Wow, we're all fucking up here, aren't we? Um, <laughs> just, just throw, throw it on the, floor. Case on the floor. I bet, um, I, bet, I bet it wasn't even picked up in the audio. You know? like, <laughs> everyone's going to go, what, yeah, what the hell video, are they talking about? I, I definitely did something there. So, you know. Um, but yeah. they um, And the combat, when I started with it, I also found incredibly frustrating. I, now, I love the combat. Yeah, this is the thing. And when, it's, when the game started to turn around for me, was when I hit the first boss. Who did you take first? Um, it was the uh, the the fire one, oh. Sirit. Sirit or something like that. Oh, we did it, it yeah, the other Sirt. way. But fair place. Yeah. So, you poor bastard, Val Ravens. Well, done. Val Ravens. Yeah, <laughs> proper dick. Um, but fucked Val Raven up. Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I, after Val Raven fucked me up a few yeah. times. <laughs> like, let's, let's not pretend otherwise. Doing it that way round, I didn't die at Val Raven at all. So I was quite pleased with that, at least. But yeah, and and then it all sort of clicked into play because there's no tutorials on the combat, right? There is a there is a this is this is the combat that you must die in towards the start of the game, mm-hmm. like you must lose to give you a sort of feel yeah. of the penalties and stuff yeah. like that. But um, it doesn't tell you what you do. You sort of there's a or when you get to the pause menu, there are the controls there. But it doesn't um, it doesn't give you the sort of scope of your attacks in context. So you kind of play with them and it takes a little while to find the timing windows when Mm. you get it suddenly. And this is when it all started to come together for me as a game, because um, um, I'll come back to that. But yeah, like then there was this flow, this sort of like energy and it was all like it felt like I was. Yeah. I was just enjoying it for once. It felt like w- I wasn't just doing it to progress the story anymore. I needed, because throughout the whole thing, the whole concept, like perhaps I'm not so hot on all of the lore stones. Um, like I'm not massive, I'm not against them, but I often I find mean, that- they- I, I love me some Norse mythology and that, so and that meant good. that actually, so, so, the, so the lore stones are- um, sort of places in the world where you find a thing and then you get a little bit of an audio like description of some Norse mythology, right? I remember yeah, that, right? Yeah, that's yeah, correct. Yeah. And like, and I find that really, really appealing. And I found that the narrator that does it like meant that I really wanted that. And normally in a game when they have like audio logs, like it's, it's pretty hit or miss. It really it's is. It's how it's delivered that's the problem for me. I think I would have enjoyed it more if it was in bigger chunks to fill some of the empty space when you're wandering about. The sort of like finding some bits of the story when wandering around these arenas that are... And this is the thing. It's it's a flawed game that I'm really enjoying. I've not finished it yet. But the concepts, the story, like the exploration are amazing. The sound design's really good. All of the voice acting's really good. But things like this, like... I understand that there's a sort of thematic purpose to all of this. Like the, you've got these big arenas, but when you complete like these first two bosses, you have to just turn around and go back. And there is. Yeah, but that fucking journey is the best. <laughs> like that, that is where I was playing the game and I was like, oh, it's fucking on now. This fits into place. Now I understand the whole sort of feel of the game the struggle that's trying to be de- described and my value like what i'm what the what senior is gaining from pushing against it like i i had been brought completely into where she was let's let's be in, be honest like a lot of that has to do with how fucking good the music is when you're going over that bridge uh, yeah for <laughs> the push, no the push forward does that though the push into these arenas does. And I don't want to be warped or teleported or anything, but like Dark Souls, those sorts of games are a very good example of how you can keep that sort of like... Oh, the puzzle box, moment, um, sort of light level yeah, design exactly. where everything this, folds back in on itself. But Wayne, they don't cost £12. I don't know. No, no, but no. My 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 argument here is that I, it's it was positioned to be a game that managed to reach the heights of AAA, but being made on a much smaller budget. I don't, that they don't ask for you to put down so much money because they know that their game isn't managing to hit things in every way. But the key notes that it does hit are so so clear, so very important. I don't. That I it don't doesn't matter. think. I don't think actually that asking for the level to sort of be a semicircle rather than a straight line is something that's going to cost 
a huge amount. Semicircles cost money, man. I, I, like <laughs> that, which is effectively the difference in what we're saying. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, there's there's like like ideas, missteps, all the rest of it. But actually, it, I never get a feel for this. And I know that it's gone through some iterations. Yeah. But I never get a feel for. I mean, occasionally, like there's a couple of like bits that I do put down to that. Occasionally, the detection on certain actions isn't very good, and that's a shame. Because, you know, it's sort of like, oh, does this door open or not? I'm not sure if it's just being janky or if it's not a way that I can go. Mm-hmm. There's things like that that I do put down to that. Mm-hmm. But this is a this is a basic level design thing. And, mm-hmm. you know, we, we expect it's even not our about three having video the, games. the money to do another art part. Yeah. It's about, yeah. In fact, it would be smaller. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like The level would be smaller. So you'd have less draw distance that you'd have to take into account everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but... I mean, as it's gone on, the levels themselves have become more and more compelling. It's become a lot better at giving you the feeling that you like that it is trying to provide through the gameplay rather than in in almost in spite of it. I feel like early on, the gameplay was almost like a barrier to me learning more about the story. And so it was feeling a bit FPXy. Remember my complaints about the old FPX? Yeah, it has a, it definitely at points has a kind of walking simulator vibe that it falls into. Yeah. um, Whereas as as it's gone on more and more, I'm growing into, I feel like I'm learning more through the gameplay and like the most recent level, um, which I can at least say um, takes place in total darkness. Oh. Is. My old friend. (laughs) Is um, possibly the most stressful bit of gaming but the most wonderful that i have ever played it really was absolutely sensational um that's a shame no i i I don't know if it's the same bit because you're too yeah i remember you talking about something else that was going to be a problem in that that i haven't encountered so we'll talk about that so that we afterwards so that we don't have any spoilers yeah that's fine but there's a like you might be able to say this the bit but like I found that the most effective way of playing part of this level was to simply close my eyes. Oh. And this. Now I know where you're talking about. Yeah, no, I I thought you were talking. No, it's not the same place. No, I know where it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, And yeah, uh, just, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was so, so well done. And the tension and the fear, but also the sort of like internal dialogue it tied together. And it, I, for the first time, it wasn't just that I was watching the story. I was in it. I was feeling it and th- okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and I guess that's what I'm talking about like I, I found that like very soon after beating those two bosses and like from that point on the game completely had me yeah. um, and and I was completely in love with it at the same time as having the hardest time playing it because <laughs> it wants it wants you to have a difficult time yeah, yeah um, it, is, it is incredibly stressful at but times. it's inc- incredibly compelling at the same time and that's and that is actually a really difficult thing to find like to create a stress that you want to consistently throw yourself into um is yeah like a fucking art and that I mean I, I think that was the most important game of... Was it last year that it came it out? Was last yeah, year, yeah. I, like, I think it was the most important game. I'm not sure if it was the best game, but I think it was the most important game of last year. I think I think we're actually like up on... It was the end of August mm-hmm. last yeah. year, so it's just been a year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm really glad to that you've got, slowly, got to thinking that yeah, it actually having, might be pretty good as got, well. Having got over the bump, like, there, like I said, there are a few bits that are frustrating, but I sort of mentioned them in context with my thing to say kind of like if someone else is picking it up and going what is this jank uh, no i agree but it's worth persevering mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um i would say that there's there's a really good thing about it which is that um once you have played the game and you've got an idea of the whole piece then there is a sort of making of documentary thing that comes with the game yeah, that's I, worth watching afterwards I, as well. I certainly will do. Yeah, but, but you I've save it for afterwards. It save it for afterwards. But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's it's fucking great. It's pretty much all I have to say. Um, and yeah, and I'm super glad that you're, that you're coming around to it too. Sweet. So I guess another game series that has made itself about sort of the 
struggle of a particular sort of charismatic heroine um, is Tomb Raider. Um, yeah, that's and the, one of the things it's about. And the new, I mean, but like the first of the new Tomb Raiders has been that. As the fucking more shooting than animals else. in the face, like being game <laughs> on the style is also thematic. So <laughs> the third one's out, and I guess you've been doing that then, Joe. Yeah, of course, because you know, whilst everyone's playing good video games like Spider Man, I'm gonna get the new Tomb Raider, you know, because I'm that kind of dude. Um, it's cool. Like it's quite. <sighs> It's been an interesting development. Um, I think personally that Tomb Raider right now is getting quite a lot of flack for like not being Spider-Man or God of War. Um, I mean, I sort of feel that it's the largest thing that it's got going against it is not being The Last of Us, but then that's the largest thing every video game's got going against it. Yeah, but and also like that's less relevant in the current climate than it was. Like yeah. things are being judged much more against things like Un- Uncharted 4 and God of War. Like any PlayStation <laughs> exclusive <laughs> is generally the barometer that uh, video games are now measured by. Um, but yeah, like... It's interesting. So in this one, uh, Lara finds herself uh, on the trail of a dagger that she's trying to like get from, uh, like stop this evil kind of religious zealot, weird, corporately structured mercenary army called uh, Trinity from grabbing hold of. They were the kind of villainous shadow organization in the in the first couple of games that alluded to in the first one, and then the main villains of the second. Lot. It's all set in Mexico. It starts with a very lovely level where you're walking through a day of the dead, having chats with your your top boy Jonah, who's been with you since the start. And you're kind of working your way through to find this tomb. And uh, like this might, this is a very short bit of game, but really this is the setup for the entire plot. Lara gets said dagger, and shit goes sideways, <laughs> casting Lara into this kind of position of doubt. You know, where she's like, I am so single-mindedly focused and the characters around her, her friends, interestingly in the dialogue, because it's it's actually, it's slipped more into something we've talked about before. The, the kind of overarching story of this video game is terrible. Uh, yeah. The writing is better than it ever has been. There are conversations that the characters have, um, concepts in what they're trying to do with cutscenes. Like, you know, people are telling Lara that it's not all about her and that she's stupid and that, you know, like really her single mindedness when you could be doing better elsewhere is like a real problem. And it's like coming from like her deep bros that you've like been with for like all of the games. Like that stuff's great. It's just a shame that this story is a confused mess. I think that might have come from Square Enix's resource change. Mm-hmm. I, I think taking Crystal Dynamics off of it to put them on whatever this Avengers game is going to be that we have seen nothing of because it's in Square Enix development hell and bringing, every and bringing Idos Montreal from the fresh off of uh, Deus Ex Invisible Wars DLC straight slap bang into that and almost twisting the entire project around has really left a lot of people, I think, standing there with their hands in there like this. Going, <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, we, like, I mean, you brought the team that can write, <laughs> But, but what is there to write? But you know what? Whatever little there is there, We're gonna they're write writing the-, the fucking shit out of it. <laughs> um, but like, I mean, one of the complaints that's always been put against Tomb Raider, which I think is has an amusing thing that's happened this time, is uh, Tomb Raider was almost the game that coined the phrase ludonarrative dissonance. Boo, his bad word. Like, you know, like gamers hate it. But, you know, it had, a, it had an element of truth within Tomb Raider. They've tried really hard to uh, lessen combat. So I played, I played like four hours, five hours in my first session. Yeah. Two combat encounters. Right. Like rest of it, me versus the jungles, the tombs, but not even like wild animals. Like this first five hours, just being stalked by one jaguar. Oh, fuck. Keeps turning up. Oh, now you're, now you're making, you're making it sound like a game I want to play. Dude, it's, it's fucking awesome, the beginning of this game. Like, <laughs> uh, and like, 
but it's it's really good it's really compelling like it's much more about the survival stuff it's much more about like your hunting and your like looking around and your way of being able to tell the environments uh it's always had these challenge tombs in them in the new in, since the reboot it's had these challenge tombs that has placed sporadically around the map now those challenge tombs are much bigger affairs huge kind of big puzzles and there's a new thing called crypts, which and the crypts are kind of like mini tombs. That and there's loads of them dotted around, but each one containing a different puzzle and a different lick of paint, um, which usually ends in some high, well, some kind of armor, which is another new thing. You end up getting armor that you can build out of your resources that give you not stat upgrades but perks. You know, so I've made some boots out of this. Um, I've that from this particular tribe and these give me like quiet walking in the jungle or they I'm wearing this cloak that like helps me harvest from birds I mean it doesn't make much fucking sense <laughs> but like but like it's nice that then it's about modifying your play style it's not about this one is the better one it's like what do I need now yep. and I always prefer that to bigger numbers because I, I what's the point yeah yeah, it's always a bit more imaginative. And, um, but I guess one of its new big things is once you're through this five hours getting used to it, you're then thrown into a town. And now when you're in this town, that's where Ludo narrative dissonance rears its ugly head again. You walk into a small town. An oiling company has been through. And Laura's going around and she's talking to the people now. There's loads of people to talk to, lots of side quests to get. And, you know, you're like, you're like, oh, what's going on? And they're like, it's terrible. Like, I'm having, I'm having a terrible time. Like, they, they came here, they've taken our oil, they've stolen our relics, and Lara's like, oh, this is so terrible. This is a terrible thing. I would never. Oh, I will sort all of this out for you. And then the minute that that cutscene is done, you run around the fucking village, raiding every single fucking pot that they have, <laughs> taking every fucking thing that isn't nailed down, including the fucking documents that they could use to build their court case against this oil company. What should shoot your guns in the air? Going, I'm fucking work of shit. It's mad. Oh, how did they not see that that's a problem? Uh, because Ludo narrative dissonance. Because the broken state of the sort of old tropes of video games and running around stealing everything. I mean, like, so you, didn't, li- you didn't go walk over and put the documents in the photocopier first? They haven't got photocopies in this village, Wayne. It's very authentic uh, middle of the jungle kind of slum vibes. <laughs> Laura will tell you all about it. All she, right. I think she spent her gap year there. Fun I don't run. know. Um, but like, but, the, but I mean, it is, it is mad. Like literally people are talking to you about how terrible and pillaged their society and culture has been by the outside world. Whilst Laura is standing there going like, keep talking whilst putting her hand in the fridge and stealing a beer. Like it's, <laughs> it's mad. Um, but yeah, like the game, despite all of this, like the game maintains being fun to play. And like that's, and obviously that's really important. But what it fails at is being really interesting. You know, like being special. You know, it's it's nice. It's fun. Like I probably not gonna think about it too much though. Once it's done, I will do it. I'm invested in Tomb Raider. I always have been, and I like to be part of the conversation. I've played every single one of the fucking video games, including Angel of Darkness, and I'm never gonna get that time back. So I'm in now. So that sort of describes how I felt the new narrative arc, or in fact, not even narrative arc, the new arc of Tomb Raider has fallen, that they came out really strong with the first of the new three Tomb Raiders and were like, we're going to have something that's distinct. We're going to like use the sort of ideas of a arena, a sort of hub world that evolves in time as different things happen there at the same time as mixing the aesthetic of the film the descent because badass women cavers is something that we should definitely make be making more people know about yeah laura should definitely be able to stab people with uh, the climbing axe which is fucking cool <laughs> yeah, it's right fucking cool shit yeah. and then as they've gone on they've sort it, it looks to me as if they've gone look we need to make this bigger and like appeal to more people and and therefore it's homogenized that they've put in good new interesting gameplay things but they haven't managed to 
create a story that's more interesting, create character dynamics that are worth spending much time with at all, apart from the one that they've built on in the first game and they built on through the second. And then the enemy that exists in the first game that wasn't very interesting becomes an even less interesting enemy in the second one, whilst everything else looks a little bit more like every other video game. I mean, like, the thing is, is if I'm being cruel, like... It's kind of a waste, you know, like, because I mean, I've talked about this trajectory before because we've argued quite a lot about the plots of these games. And I have, and I mean, I can't really believe where we're at with it because literally the game started with a great story, terribly written. (laughs) Yeah. Then had a better, a a worse story, better written. (laughs) Yeah. Now they've got a terrible story. Not only phenomenally written, the voice actors have jumped on on this to flex their muscles because it's so well written. Like they're shouting and screaming at each other and emoting and their voices are cracking and the facial animations are fucking amazing. But to what end is the question? (laughs) Because there's nothing. There's nothing actually there. It's a vapour. You know, like it's not, it's, ah, it's so, it's so difficult. I mean, I'm going to push forward to the end and hopefully there'll be some sort of a payoff. I'm not very confident with it. And I think like, I mean, I think historically, Z, you, you, you'll be remembered as the man that called this one. <laughs> like really, I think it really has gone exactly the trajectory that you kind of pointed out for it. I'm not in, I think it's got much more to do with Squaresoft's management mm. of the project than it has to do with the I, can I be honest incredibly talented people that are working on this game because the other thing artistic direction wise my god it is gorgeous like it's got like some of the best jungles I've ever seen in a video game the mud puts uncharted fours there there could be a mud off going on in 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 those two games like it it's really interesting and I do I, I kind of disagree with how the franchise is homogenized you know, like into kind of current video games, because I think that actually Tomb Raider's, it's kind of locked down its own little special piece of what if Uncharted was also a bit of a Metroidvania, which I, you know, I like, I like Metroidvanias and I like Uncharted. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm directly there in the middle of that graph. So like, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I want someone else to have it though now. When this is done now, this is the end of this trilogy and I think it's time for someone else to have a crack at old Lara. Because I just, can do it Montreal right. needs to go back to making Deus Ex. Yeah, I think they want that. I from mean, what I've heard... Like all anyone been, else wants from yeah, them as well. I think from what I've heard, that where everything that they've been saying on their social medias I has mean, been like, oh, when we're done with fucking Tomb Raider, then we'll make a game that we want to make. They're, they're fucked now though, because like, whenever they fucking finish making that, like Cyberpunk's going to either be about to come out or have come out. There's space for that. I mean, you're right. I can have I'm more Cyberpunk games. It's fine. Wanna, oh, just because <laughs> Cyberpunk is out, it means I never want a Deus Ex again. You're mad. <laughs> That's the silliest thing you've ever said. You want two <laughs> Deus Exes. No, hold, hold the fuck on right, man. Because like when it comes down to it, The Raid and Dread came out in the same year and everybody was saying, oh my God, these films have copied each other. Why even? I was like, yeah, it's fucking great. I get to have it twice. So I'm not going like to be upset. It's Armageddon and Deep Impact, except both of them are brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be upset if they both come out close to each other. But I do think that it is quite likely that their sales will be eaten by cyberpunk or maybe cyberpunk yeah, and then Square and Enix the other will way. sit there in their ivory tower made out of selling body pe- pillows to teenagers and go told you you couldn't make another day sex game <laughs> <laughs> taste my game face so Joe when you're on the podcast these days, you tend to like to bring us a a game from your, like something that like people should know about, but maybe don't. Uh, what we like to call those is Joe's Irresponsible with Money Games, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> yeah, but not that irresponsible because they're really old and therefore not that expensive. Depends what the game is, and I'm pretty sure my girlfriend would disagree. <laughs> um, but... Uh, well, actually, Wayne, you came around recently. Yeah, and um, one one of the treasures that I, that I've discovered is a uh, Bushido Blade, which is a game I have in my my memory from my younger days. But um, we never really 
surprisingly, it wasn't in our circles, who I think were pretty prime for that game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's this sort of thing that, like, I remember it made a lot of talking rounds when it was out because of, like, what... Like, it's key, key vibe, right? And the thing that everyone remembers it for is, like, it's a, it's a fighting game where if you get hit in the leg, you lose your leg. And we'll find out that's not necessarily exactly so. true. Yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, and and it was that kind of like perma damagey sort of thing, and being wounded and weakened, yeah, and and the kind of one hit kill. Yes. Yeah, like that. That kind of it, like it's two people facing off against each other, and like if you get hit properly hard in your head or your torso, it's curtains. You know. Maybe the PlayStation One was not the best platform for that because <laughs> loading is an issue. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like at least when you're playing Tekken, you know, like you can kind of, uh, you, you know, you get a good three rounds yeah, before you have to seconds out of sit it. down for twenty five seconds. <laughs> but um, but yeah, but it says dressed that up. Just, in- that surely that just builds the tension. You're just there, like knowing that you're about to enter the one hit kill arena. Yeah, yeah, like it, it, it really does. I mean, one of the things we were talking about a lot while we were playing it is how, like the world, the world is primed for this game now. Yeah, like, like, like a reboot of Bushido Blade at this point with all of the things that we've got. And how quick things are to load and how snappy it could be, like, would be, uh, you know, kind of like a games bar favourite. Like, I mean, Nidhogg is the best. That's one hit Nidho- kills yeah, with swords. And, yeah, but like, you know, there's something about, there, there's something very different about having it all rendered in a completely 3D. When you're in like a completely 3D, so, wow, well, it's not completely 3D, is it? Some of the shit that I'm about to talk about is definitely a fucking 2D square. But when you're in a, when you're on a 3D square of green <laughs> with no definition. Oh, ju- and ju- ju- just two, green. Yeah, then. and there are two dimensional bamboo forests. <laughs> That as you swing your sword, they cut in half and fall down. Like, because I think one of the things that me and you, Wayne, can do, which is one of the reasons why retro is very important to us, is um, we can take ourselves back. Yes. Yeah. And like, like we can see how it was awesome. <laughs> you know, like how like it was was the most amazing so, thing. I ask myself this, like about this game. I have been asking myself since we played it whether or not I would have thought it was awesome at the time. Because there are things like the bamboo cutting that we were like, my God, we would have absolutely blown our minds out. Like we would have, we, we would have been running around the streets going like, God, the bamboo, this is amazing. Um, All you'd have been moaning about is saying it was an unnecessary gameplay feature. Like you did about <laughs> everything Hideo Kojima put into his games. No, I, the thing is, I don't mind unnecessary features as long as there's an actual game behind it. And that yeah, was you, my problem yeah, with Mel Gibson Solid 2. <laughs> Yeah, you had it in for them flags. I really did. The fucking pull-ups. The fuck? Why? Anyway. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of bad things to say about flags in video games. I'm looking at you, Assassin's Creed. Oh, Jesus Christ. Those were some bad flags. But yeah, so Bushido Blade. We set ourselves in and got real comfy with it. Yeah, like... like we, we must p- have had about 60 or 70 games. Yeah, yeah. Because we, we hit every character trying to work out what they do. And like, once we were through that, we were like, what combinations... And like, this is the really... Like, actually, this is one of the things that's really nice about playing games as an adult. It's like, we were sitting there and we were like, not what's going to win. We were like, what would be a what would be a weird pairing of weapons to have up against each other? Yeah, you know, like what? And it didn't matter if like one of us had the ev- the distinct ev- because we don't know what the fuck we're doing with Bushido Blade. So anyway, we're playing Bushido Blade and we're playing for about forty five minutes. That's not a complete session. This is how long we were playing it before Wayne realised you could jump. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> while I was in the toilet. He, he cheated and read the instruction manual. <laughs> yeah, because that's, that's, that's a that's way... Not that's a, no, it's a fucking fully way move. <laughs> if it's there, he's going to use it. Oh, yeah. that son of a bitch. To jump, you have to double tap forward, press circle... No, is it, it R1 and R2? R1 and L1. R1 and L1. It was like forward, forward, R1, L1, but as a flow. Yeah, as you a, couldn't You so, couldn't... So, so that's like taking two steps forward and then like one step to the jump and then the other one in the jump, right? Yeah. Oh, but mate, 
Mate, the jump was incredible. Because we're playing this game, right, which is about two people sword fighting in a field. Yeah. Right. And we, as I say, we've been playing for ages. And then when I say jump, it's like man <laughs> just goes fucking full crouching tiger and just goes whoop, straight up into the ceiling. And like, I was like, what the fuck is that? Like, I thought it had broken yeah, for a you second. End up, you end up about 15 yards away, don't you? It's like, it's, it's, a, dis- it's a distance closer. <laughs> That's not what I expected. Well, I used it as a distance gainer, didn't I, for the most part? Because what what you realised is if you press forward and heavy attack, I would die. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> if was... I started by pressing forwards and heavy, heavy attack, I would always kill Regardless Wayne. of whether was or not 15, I, there I was retaliated a... <laughs> with forwards and heavy attack. There was a 15-minute period where Wayne was on the receiving end of, of, of a very big sword. <laughs> and his counter to that being to fly. <laughs> Get over, and then obviously I didn't know what the fuck was going on so he instantly cracked me in the back of the head because actually turning around is difficult yeah like that's that's no that's no easy easy thing to achieve in Bushido <laughs> Blade because uh, the other thing to mention is it's quite an early PlayStation 1 game and um, it's um, it's by Square Enix well it's Square Soft at the time but what we now know is Square Enix but um, they were a very interesting company at this time because they were fucking drunk off of all of the money that they had made from Final Fantasy 4, Final Fantasy 6, Chrono Trigger, Secret of Mana, Final Fantasy 7. Like that like and they had so much money that they could take gambles. Like they made fighting games. They made like three four fighting games for the PS1. They made a they made a scrolling shooter. They made a Zelda like like they they just they, they were just making interesting shit all the time. And what's really fascinating about Bushido Blade is Bushido Blade is a fucking curiosity piece in the subgenre of being a fighter. Like, I, it must have been hard to kind of convince people that that was a good idea at the time. Like a fighting game where you just take one hit. Yeah, I, I, and I, like that's the thing. As much as like, because it had like it had all of the things that you would expect of that today, right? It had the the ability to deflect weapons, the ability to get locked in. But it it did also have a ridiculous amount of jank. Oh yeah! Uh, like if you were within, if you were within a sort of you know center circle penalty area sort of space of a wall, your sword would probably collide with it when you swung it, regardless of which direction you were pointing. Sometimes you could have your opponent backed into a wall and miss them and hit the wall. Um, and yeah, yeah you'd be aiming at their head and hitting the wall. So right. that sort of thing is why I didn't really get my head around 3D games in the PlayStation 1 era. But what I was saying to Wayne is we wouldn't have even been annoyed at it because we'd have been so gassed that the sword didn't just clip through the wall. <laughs> like cuz like that's what all of the other games did, you know, at the time. I think that might be where where my like as you've said that Maybe it was because I did rather expect the sword to clip through the wall. And I was wondering why it wasn't, because that's how I would approach games like that right. from that era. But yeah, I mean, it, it is it's just begging for it is begging for a re-release because all of the all of the mechanics, all of the thoughts were there. The running away was fucking golden as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's got a very good running mechanic. If you just hold one of the buttons down, it turns into a free run mode. Rather than a sort of mm-hmm. strafing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's fucking full Benny Hill. Like, <laughs> like it's like because you can hold down your power attack and there was literally a bit where Wayne was running away with his short sword whilst I was running around around with the hammer extended over the back of my head, just running around the battlefield trying to mop him. It was, was like, like a prototype for the Smash Brothers hammer, was, wasn't it? Yeah, I was little rabbit frou-frou, bruv. I was trying to bop him on the head. Oh, beautiful. Um, I've just remembered something really important to this conversation, which is today the podcast the day that the podcast comes out this episode of the podcast comes out there is another one hit kill game that is being released on switch towerful baby is that out today yeah yeah today in the future <laughs> today in the future okay so, so if you're listening to this you can get towerful on switch if you have a switch and you damn well should because it's fucking great so yeah. yeah, well, like that's it's, it's not. It's obviously not Bushido Blade. But no, it isn't. It's, uh, I mean, like, I, I mean, I, arguably, it's a bit better than Bushido Blade. You know, like, I mean, if I had to pick one, 
then you'd obviously the greatest Bushido game Blade. of all time or Bushido Blade. I mean, like, I, I mean, like that's actually the thing, isn't it? It's because like I wouldn't, I wouldn't play Bushido Blade over over a towel for as much as I enjoy it. But what I am, in, I am interested to play Bushido Blade again. And I and I was interested with trying to work out how those systems kind of work with each other and how, and we barely scratched the surface of I, what the fuck is going on. I in that think game. I, I just it did feel just a little bit too dice rolly for me. Uh, like ultimately, it like like I say, all of the mechanics, all of the concepts were great, and I can like transposing myself into that head as well. I was like, whoa, look at this! This is amazing, but but. I don't know why that hit didn't kill you. Sometimes you'd run at me and be like, slash, 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 slash. And I'd be like, yeah, fuck you. Stab. And you'd die. Yeah. And it was like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, yeah, like there, no, no... there were some particular weapons that didn't work. I remember, like, the hammer was poor. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, I'd, be hit, I'd hit you three times in the head. And and you'd be like, oh, it's chill. And then you'd, like, stab me once and you'd cut the end of my nose. And I'd just be like... Bah! I mean... If you can take a hammer blow to the head, you can take a hammer blow to the head. Oh, that's true. If you can take one, you can take three. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true. <laughs> I mean, as long I'm as they're not to, exactly the same. Bullshit on what, that. what you did is 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 you knocked him in on one side and then you knocked him back out on the other. Oh, okay, I see. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, um, so are there any other PlayStation One games that you're looking forward to playing in the near future? It's funny you should say that because as of yesterday, pre-orders went live for the PlayStation Classic Mini. Can I clarify? This isn't yesterday in the future. No, this isn't yesterday in the future. This is yesterday in the RL. So yesterday in the past, the people who are listening. Or is it the CT, the current timeline? I don't know. But anyway. Uh, We're 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 dealing with actual time here. (laughs) I'm asking you, you you two are both physics. I mean, like, how does this work with Minkowski and space-time and and space-time geodesics? Stop it. (laughs) (laughs) That's the best response. (laughs) That's the best response to that I could have hoped for. (laughs) So anyway. Tiny Playstations are coming to you in, at, just before Christmas. Um, they cost £90, which I think is a little bit steep, actually. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. Uh, they've 90? Got, yeah. That's as much as they cost originally. Th- they actually have uh, games built in, though. At the, at the end of their lifespan. I think you're Wait. paying for, you're paying in effect, for the software. Yeah. Right? Um, it doesn't even take discs, does it? You no, know, no, it's too, too, too tiny for that. And yeah, but then remember the PS1 it was like fucking almost a credit card and still you could it was just about big enough for a CD and it would still work <laughs> <laughs> it's quite possible that people have no idea what you mean when you say PS1 there because they're like aren't you aren't you talking about the PlayStation 1 the PlayStation Classic no, he's, being he's the talk- PlayStation he's 1 t- he's talking about the pearly white Discman, pretty yeah, much, right? Was, like, like you could put it so all, it almost in your back pocket. Because remember, at the time that the PlayStation was released, it was called the PlayStation because there weren't any more of them. Uh, it was it was sometimes colloquially referred to as the PSX as well. Yeah, yes. but that that was I, like I think that was after the PS2 came out as well. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was or after the PS2, it but it was definitely approaching sort of it. Like, yeah. yeah, approaching it to sort mm-hmm. of like distinguish it. And then and there that was, was the based PS1. on its sort of code name. But yeah, but then the PS1, it won spell, you know. Is this the same only, like, generation that the Xbox One is from? No, no, because that would have been time travel again. <laughs> I mean, if anybody could. <laughs> if you, I mean, like, don't get me into light cones. I know you're trying to drag me there, but. <laughs> <laughs> they all point towards <laughs> the singularity. So, but the amazing thing about this is you now don't have to go back in time to play Jumping Flash. It comes preloaded on a console. We were just working out how to help you do that. <laughs> no, no, no. So, I, I, it's all right. Sony have got me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but they've announced five games, haven't they? Yeah, they have. So we've got Final Fantasy VII, Jumping Flash, Ridge Racer, Type uh, Four, Type Four, Tekken Three, and my mystery game. Yeah, that I one can't remember. Another game. Um, and I'm, I mean, like, I'm excited because, you know, I'm, I, I've been regarding Jumping Flash for quite a long time as a game that I want to play. It's in. probably still going to be cheaper to just buy the disc for that one. <laughs> yeah. But, but hold on, hold the fuck on a second. 
I don't know what Jumping Flash is. Help me out here. Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Jumping Flash is a game where you play a robot rabbit that's really, really, really big. There goes another drink. I'm excited about Jumping Flash. And, <laughs> um, and basically, you kind, of, uh, you kind of jump, right? That's your thing. You're a rabbit. What do rabbits do? They jump. So you jump straight up into the air and then you use your kind of mechanics to glide you down onto 3D platform space. It was a very early 3D platformer. Um, it's, but also from the time where people didn't really know what they were doing with that. So it's a very unique 3D platformer. Um, and uh, as a curiosity piece, it's been something I've always been very interested in playing. Like the aesthetic of it is very Japanese, very weird, but also kind of charming you know i think that anyone that actually had a playstation around the time of its release might have vague memories of it from demo one yeah because it was one of the games that was pre was loaded onto the demo disc that came with the console um so anybody that's your like the the specific age difference that we have is key here yes because although i knew many people that had a playstation right in terms of actually remembering dealing with demo disc one rather than the video games that i ended up playing on those playstations after the fact no fucking idea those extra four years you guys have on me are key here well i mean like we spent a lot of time getting demo discs yeah, we spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time playing Demo One because we bought two games with a console, did those, and then couldn't afford any more games. Yeah, so, those were the days. Yeah, I mean, like, I had a subscription to PSM, and they sent me a new demo disc every month, which is predominantly what I played. And I'm not going to lie, the demo of the Ghost in the Shell game, I had so so much fun playing over and over and over again. Interesting that you should mention them because that Ghost in the Shell game was the game that this company made after they made Jump flash too ah. yeah it's all connected do you think that on the playstation classic mini we will get terror incognito <laughs> i think net euros games are probably off the table um oh, that's go uh, is it, i am very very scary <laughs> I am very very scary so this is a particular uh, what, what wayne has done is he's made an incredibly in joke about the fact that me and wayne had access to Indie games, well, so are they even indie games? No, they're not. Yeah, they are indie games. Okay, so games that are made, but they by, were never properly released. Yeah. Is the problem, right? The demo discs that we had, they'd always put these. They had a particular PlayStation that came out that was like a dev kit called the Net Euros. Yeah, and the Net Euros would let you design your own games. Some of them were Terry Incognito. <laughs> Others were Hover Car Racer, which was fantastic. The angriest Wayne has ever been at me has been when we were playing Hover Car Racer. You know, like it's it's it, it they were they were good, but we said obviously we had that child patience. You know, we like, when you had nothing but yeah, time. Like, yeah, I mean, like, what were we gonna do? Play fucking Final Doom again? We've already done it sixteen times. Like, <laughs> play fucking Hover Car Racer. I mean, Let's take a punt. I mean, you, you probably were gonna play it again just later. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. We definitely did. Yeah. <laughs> but hey. I mean, Z, but what, I, I want, like, because Z has got experience with a PlayStation, right? And I, I was wondering what he wanted to see on the classic. Because they've only well, announced about 297, right? No, I the, don't. I actually. Right. So the specific period of video games, the first foray into 3D is a time that I do not care for. Everything was too jank. Like, I, I, I know that lots of people going back to games from then go, oh man, God, everything was really difficult to deal with. Things didn't work the way they were supposed to. You couldn't really see what was going on. I felt like that then. So like I, there is, there is very little on the PlayStation 1 that draws me in. And if it does, it was 2D. I mean, I love the shit out of Rayman, but like... And and Wipeout 2097, but even Wipeout 2097, like, manages to exist in a particular space because the incredibly polygonal design that anything 3D had to have then fitted with, like, the hovercrafts going round, uh, going round a sort of futuristic racing track. And it's definitely got better since. So I'd rather just play the last Wipeout. You do like Symphony of the Night. Yeah, but... Is, wait, is, is that is that where Symphony of the Night yeah, came out Symphony first? Symphony of the Night is a PlayStation One game. Uh, well, man, I didn't play it until it came out until it was re-released on the Xbox oh, 360. True. But I do love Symphony of the Night. 
but it's not 3D. That, that is, is kind of key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, like, because I think the thing f- for me to defend the position, yeah, is I, I think that it's an incredibly, an absolutely incredibly important, like, historical landmark of shit being bizarre and us trying to work it out. I think it's such a historically important, and I love, I love it. I love seeing these unique and different ways that people tried to broach the 3D problem before we standardised yeah. how and, one would deal with it. And I definitely, and I definitely think it's a really like nice thing to exist, an important touchstone in terms of the the animals of like gaming history and being able to play that is great um but yeah but it's it's just not something that i particularly wanted to do then and it's not something i particularly want to go back to now because i didn't want to do it then at the same time like where the playstation came from the history of how that console came into being like the deals with nintendo that didn't pan out in terms of creating a disc drive so sony thought fuck it in like the most un-japanese thing ever fuck it we'll do it ourselves and thusly playstation was born and now we have the last of us and god of war and all of the brilliant games that have come out in this generation like it is it is a wonderful thing to have a a sort of memento of that like the ability to go back then and find out what where it all started yeah. but, but i don't it's I interesting don't to there. look at it in those terms as well though because also at the same time you know you're like and we would have this god of war and the last of us but like instantly the reason why like one of the big reasons that the playstation exists is because square can crack final fantasy 7 out on a car you know and like so if sony hadn't have taken that move and taken square with them, who knows what would happen to Final Fantasy? Like, where would that be now? I wouldn't have had my, like, wonder time with the good bros on their, like, weekend bender that would have went wrong in Final Fantasy 15. <laughs> yeah, no. So, I mean, have you got any... What, what, have you got any games you're crossing your fingers for? Absolutely. Yeah, I want... Um, I would like some... We got... We got shafted. We're British. We got shafted. <laughs> yeah, we didn't, like... We really didn't have enough of the Squaresoft RPG. So I don't want Final Fantasy 7. I don't want Final Fantasy 9. I don't want that. I don't want that. I want Parasite Eve 1 is what I want. I want Parasite Eve 1. I want Chrono Cross. I, I have Chrono Cross. I bought an imported copy of it. But like, I, I none of the things that I need to make that work now work. So I have, I like, I, I want to play that again. Like my sister's really gassed to play that again. I, Brave Fencer Musashi springs to mind, like as something that like I quite like. Oh, Shadow Tower, like like the old From Software game, like I I would really like to play that in the even more archaic times of From Software. <laughs> yeah. Oh mate, yeah. I'd I'd love to have a look at that actually. Yeah. Persona, um, Persona One and Two, like things like that, like I think would be really 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 interesting. I understand. I'm we're not getting them though, are we? I mean, there's. I hope I, I've of- got I I uh, to be honest. <sighs> oh, I think that I think I think the high bets for this outside chance probably do lie on Parasite Eve. Yeah, no, like that's a huge game that has a huge influence. Well, I don't think in Parasite Eve was a little bit kind of like dark and. It was like the cinematic RPG. It was like Resident Evil meets Final Fantasy. Yeah. Um, with the integrity of something that, like, because it's actually about science and it was about characters that develop and it was about biology. And it was a, like kind of the spiritual sequel to a book written, um, the uh, also called Parasite Eve, which was about like kind of uh, biology gone wrong, kind of island of Dr. Moreau, very obsessed with mitochondria. I'm pretty sure that Parasite Eve helped me get those high scores in my uh, science GCSEs, you know. So like it's a, you know, like it was a very good game. And I, uh, but I only ever had the opportunity to play it from the boot of people at Sunday Market because like, you know, like you want to fucking sell it to me square. I'm, I'm just saying this straight up like I, I'll fucking I'll pirate the shit out of anything if you're not going to let me buy it but if you look at my wall of video games if you let me buy it I've, I've fucking bought it 
I'd buy it again, probably, because for some reason I forget what games I have, and then I go through my video collection and I go, "Why have oh, I got two, two of copies of? of Why have I got two copies of Soul Calibur 2? <laughs> I guess I forgot that because it's had got it. two in the name, so you got to have two copies, right? <laughs> On the same system, so I've got two <laughs> copies of Soul Calibur that both have Link in. <laughs> <laughs> Can't I mean, have enough Link. My like my own hopes. I, <laughs> Ballerina to Shinden too, right? Ballerina to Shinden <laughs> would be hilarious. I don't think I'd get much mileage out of it today. No. Um, I mean, like, strange. I think one of the games that I would actually play again and again if I had it on something with a HDMI cable is um, Destruction Derby. Well, like, let's that be, was that let's, was like psychosis as well, wasn't it? Let's um, be honest, we played that quite recently together and had a fucking lovely time playing through the campaign of that game. Yeah, it's just brilliant. It's so it's I, it's a massively overdue a reboot actually. Although again, the company that did it don't do video games anymore. No. So. <laughs> Maybe. So uh, was it was it a Psygnosis developed or just Psygnosis published game? I think it was developed. I mean, they did, yeah. they did develop a shitload of they games. Did that a shitload I, I mean, it's very, like it was it's a very interesting game because it's kind of like the racing game. Kind of, it's like weirdly zoomed out, so the cars are quite small. Like well, like you might imagine in like a micro machinesy kind of game, running around these very intricate tracks, which always have an overlapping part where everyone can smash. <laughs> which you know is it like you know just is fantastic like trying to weave your way through the through like the oncoming traffic is really 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 just, good just just a little bit of burnout in there just yeah. a little bit of burnout yeah but also there. also like it had very like for the time excellent damage like the like your cars were modeled with what was it like it's eight points of damage yeah. Yeah, so you had like, you know, your like kind of front, uh, your front, yeah, your, your front right, your front wheels. left. Yeah, like all like all the way around the car. And the more those bits got damaged, the u- more useless they'd become. But, you know, obviously if you took it in the engine, that was, that was it. Yeah, game over. But you could live with everything else is the thing. Like everything else going, but you'd lose assets. Like Bushido played. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you'd lose different assets. And actually thinking back, I think this is the reason that I didn't like Wipeout for years. Because it meant that they didn't make another Destruction Derby game. Ah. Oh. Did like, you ever have two? No, I didn't. My uncle had it and I borrowed it and played it through. So oh, I never right, actually so went out and got it myself. It, yeah. So actually, give me Destruction Derby 2 because I don't own the first one. I mean, I mean, the other problem with Wipeout is that it's why we never got any, any more um, Roll Cage. That it was deemed to be the more popular series mm-hmm. and therefore they didn't make any more Roll Cage. They only made Wipeout. Grip's, so bring grip's on very grip. near release date so um, I'm real excited really yeah, really excited I, I, need, um, I think in time for the next pod unless the release date is super oh, eminently after that dude. in time for the next pod I'll give it a serious go and report back on what's changed since the my first instance it's sweet I'm like yeah I am I'm just I'm biding my time I want it to be done by the time I get it but like I I want me some grip um should we do some questions yeah, we haven't. Well, I haven't been here for a while. Have you, how have the questions been whilst they've been away? I mean, we haven't had many questions. Oh, okay. I think I did a question whilst you weren't here. Oh, well, one of my questions. Oh. But um, yeah, like we've we've got we've had a few this week. Um, uh, variable in size. So, uh, do you want to read these out, Wayne? Shall I? Yeah, uh, um, sure. I mean, I, I will paraphrase them. Apologies, guys, if I feel if you feel like I've missed the essence. But thank you for writing in and to keep them coming. We'll yeah, if talk you want as many as we can. If you, you want to send us any now? questions, yeah, if you want to send us any questions, you can do so at Taste My Game Face slash contacts, where you'll find links to uh, uh, Gmail, which is Taste My Game Face at Gmail dot com, um, our Twitter at Taste My Game Face, and our Discord, which is where we get most of our questions from. Um, and you can just follow the link to the Discord to join in there. Um, there's also um, a link to our YouTube channel as well, and we're always after more subscribers because although we have almost all of the people in the world subscribed we still have at least two people that haven't yeah yeah, yeah. and one of them's joe so whoever's left (laughs) (laughs) get involved yeah everyone's waiting for you mate yeah sort it out exactly although yeah who what it was you that claimed that we'd looped through all of the numbers despite the (laughs) fact that there are always more numbers well, I mean, do you know that for certain? Yeah. If you keep counting, is that necessarily That's, what yes, happens? Not, no. Then how how if you add or how if you add all of the uh, positive integers, do you end up with minus uh, twelfth? You don't. 
But you do. No, it's a... Oh, hang on. What's the word? It's an anal- analytic continuation of the Riemann zeta function. Yeah, exactly. And it's not actually the... It, the sum- no one show me how this doesn't work. And it is and it's something a, that is used in quantum mechanics. There are, a couple of, there are a couple of really good ways of showing that it doesn't no, work. It, it's... <laughs> it's <laughs> <laughs> says it's, says Joe. It's okay. So basically, the series itself diverges, right? And therefore, because it doesn't converge, there's no limit, so you can't put an absolute sum on it. However, if right, you I, apply, I think I, this is not the place to explain this. <laughs> Look, we can Look, we can have this argument the another question. time. You've, 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 I'm really you've interested. Set, you've set the little under, bits. Of, to, you've <laughs> set the little bits of candy out, right? All through the podcast. Now I'm under the fucking box. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> The trap is sprung. Yeah, exactly. but, but this is obviously a very important question, but is it more important than the questions of our listeners? Oh, yes. Fine. Oh, fine. Yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying to bring it back. Bring okay, it back. so um, uh, we'll do, the first one we'll do is from uh, Nerd404 UK, um, who uses an acronym. It took us a little while to decode, but it's fine. Um, yeah, what is TO shadows? Well, uh, about, I was going to just go over it. I was going to... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah. it took us a while. We worked out that it's shadows of the Tomb Raider. Exactly. That's so, a completely different order. So shadows, <laughs> uh, shadows of the Tomb Raider came out last week and I was looking to buy it for my girlfriend who has played every other game and really enjoys them. However, we also pick up the physical items in the game. Um, physical items that are released in the game. So what are your fe- the feelings on the physical items that games are spawning? Should we still have pre-orders for such physical items? And is gaming more about the game? uh, Is gaming less about the game and more about the shiny physical items and or beyond DLC release extras? Or is it still about the game? I think that's probably, I think we can all agree that's taking the whole concept a little bit too far. (laughs) Um, But I mean, this is obviously someone that's very into the whole sort of concept of collectibles. And so might see the collectibles as as much of a draw. I think, you know, um, are there any collectibles, that you, the follow-up question, are, are there any collectibles we've passed up but would still like now? Can I can I just uh, drop a, a deep cut in here? Ooh, the shiny ones. <laughs> are you with me? Are you with me? Um, so... Was that Gollum? I don't know. I don't no. Know. <laughs> no, this is Baldur's Gate 2. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like collectible bullshit, right? Like, I think... I well, I mean, you, you can finish there. You've I, basically done it. Like. <laughs> okay, like... I mean, I have some. There was a time in my life where I thought it was interesting because it began to be a thing. I was like, oh, video games. I love video games. And you're giving me a way to express that a little bit more. I'm in. And then I was like, oh, no. Everything that I seem to get is pretty cheaply made with a few exceptions and actually the value that I'm the amount of money that I'm spending on it is so much more than the game which is where the actual value for me lies that I should probably sack this shit off and then I did and then I started doing a video game podcast and realized that we needed a background so occasionally buy a stupid thing for that sake now oh you actually so there are new things on there yeah one okay it was a bit of a mistake, to be frank, actually. It's I, a good, I, I've a good example. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it's interesting because let's like... It, gamers are, they're a really interesting bunch. Like people have different things that they want to get out of stuff. Um, and I think Ooh, that... So, just to interrupt, I should say that I don't feel that my opinion should apply to everyone. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, so I, I think that... Some people want to show and present themselves as someone that likes a particular product. And the way that they might choose to do that is to invest in a collector's edition. And now, Wayne, like I might say that maybe that's something that you like to do, which is why you occasionally wear a T-shirt that has magic carp on it. You know, you're presenting an image of yourself as someone who likes Pokemon enough to know that Magic Carp is the fucking number one. It's funny. You're trying to get, you're trying to get ahead of what I'm going to say later. I like it, but carry on. Okay. But like, and, and like, is he right now? You're wearing a Sonic the Hedgehog t shirt. Cost me a penny. Yeah. You're, Sonic don't care. A literal penny. Oh, yeah. But you're advertising Sonic the Hedgehog right the fuck now. <laughs> fucking late stage <laughs> capitalism got me. Yeah. But like, and like, man, I used to wear video game t-shirts. Oh my God. Like how many video game t-shirts have you guys seen me in over the years? Loads. I've kind of given up on wearing 
clothing that either represents me as somebody who likes a film, likes a band, or likes a video game, because I don't really want to to hinge myself upon that. Uh, At the same time, you look into my collection of video games, my God, the amount of plastic crap that exists. I have fucking, I got a Raziel in a box for some reasons. And like someone bought me like all of the figures from Gears of War in a big box. Like, what, why did that happen? That's never something. Pe- like, people buy me video game related merchandise, like socks, pants, things like that, because I, you know, like it's something that I like. Like, I, you know, like, bless my mum. Yeah, bless her. She'll turn up sometimes. She'll be like, I saw something and I thought of you. And she'll give me an Assassin's Creed t-shirt and a free pack of Assassin's Creed novellas that she found in the works for four quid. And I'll look at her and I'll be like, Thank, thanks, mum. And I know that I don't want any of them. <laughs> I'm not going to wear... I like Assassin's Creed, yeah. Like, it's fine. Like, it's something that I'm interested in. But my relationship with Assassin's Creed is far more complicated than like you know the fact that like my mum just sees things as like things that I play and like you know is trying super hard and being super wonderful at trying to you know like give me more things of the thing that I might like and I think that it's one of those things that quite a lot of people grow out of you know like kind of representing themselves like that so yeah. now I just buy ridiculously special editions of video <laughs> games because I don't buy any of the superfluous tat around the outside but I just bought the Croft edition of so like when you're Tomb when you're Raider. talking about sort of growing out of that, you're saying that instead of people as they grow up recognizing that they don't need to identify themselves by the things that they enjoy, and that they have an identity separate to that, and therefore they don't have to wear that to go. I have a personality. Look, it's liking all of these things, and that actually you are more of a human than that. But at the same oh, time, no, I don't. That makes it sound far more arrogant than I think that I'm presenting it. Mm. Like I no like, no no uh, no. no. But but I'm saying not you, not you oh, individually. I'm saying oh, okay. that any indiv- oh, any the person, royal you, <laughs> yes, <laughs> the, the, the royal you. you. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, <laughs> hold on a minute. Yeah. So so the the in not needing to identify by the things that you consume anymore, the things that you like to go. I am this sort of person because I like this sort of thing that it's fine to lose a lot of the sort of more obvious parts of that. But then there's still a desire to collect cool looking shit because it looks cool. I, no, well, no, but I mean like that, my personal truth is I like, I like, I mean, I've always collected my family collect, like my mum collects books, my sister, coll- <laughs> well, no, my mum collects books. My dad collects uh, records and CDs. And football programs. And, and football programs and football memorabilia and old posters from, I assume, football toilets and places like that. Like whatever he can get his grubby mitts on. I mean, he went to a fucking calf that was selling, that was, that was getting down its big board pictures of black and white Leighton Orient. Yeah. He went around the calf and he bought them all and he stuck them up in the house. These big boards that were on like a calf. Yeah, he just went around and said, you're getting rid of them. I'll take them off your hands because I know what I need. A wall-sized picture of like 1958 era late Orient. Oh, it was probably 62, 63. Oh, okay. It was probably the season. I mean, I haven't seen it, but it's probably I'm the glad. year it was in, they I, were in the top flight. It's not important, mine. But, <laughs> but, 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 at the same, but at the same time, like, I think that it's like... I don't know, like, so it runs in my family. And so for me, my passion is video games. So I collect video game things, like, that's what I do. But I, I also have had a big passion for film. Do you remember the size of my DVD collection? It's not healthy, was it? <laughs> Neither is my video game collection. It's like my thing that I do. And I used to buy more of the superfluous stuff. Like the last run I had with that was Amiibos. And then I realised that I bought most of my Amiibos quite cheap. Like I didn't do any of that Amiibo stupidness and that Amiibo stupidness and that Nintendo scalping universe kind of put me off of the whole thing. But also at the same time, I realised I could buy more video games. Like if I, I can, I can turn 12 quid into Amiibo or I can go to CEX and I can turn a tenner into five PlayStation 2 video games. 
the you've no, done the fucking math. So yeah. it's, it's, it's all about opportunity cost for you. It's now, something that you're interested in, but the opportunity cost makes it less of a value proposition no, but than it also, would otherwise be. Yeah, but also, like, I don't... I, I like. Do I like the Amiibos? I or know. do I like them because I like video games? So what do I like more? Do I like Amiibos or do I like video games? I think I like video games more. So can I have more of those, please? And I will collect them. Like that's that's the thing that I'll collect now. I will collect physical video games. I will go on the internet, buy all video games for cheap. I'll look around for them. I'll head in. I'll dive into a charity shop hoping I can get a copy of fucking I don't know Spider Man Two for the PS Two or something. Like I would like that's what I do now. So like I own a number of video game collectibles, but I can't recall the last one I bought. A lot of the scenario of all of the things that I own, and I made that decision very early on. In fact, like. I think it came more with the decision that I don't really like things. I now, agree. This is this I is, like having less stuff. Yeah, yeah. I for me, like I I love my games collection, and if I were to ever move, like you know, like seriously move, that that could be an issue. Like if I ever had to downsize or something like that, the, my video game collection could be a problem there. Because I, I would probably take up all of the storage and the main living space with it. But that's cool. That's cool. Gemma's shoes can go elsewhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it's... Um, yeah, and so like the game collection is the key thing. But I've never really... Yeah, like the things concept is just something that... Yeah, it just feels unnecessary at this point. And I don't have displays. I don't put stuff up. This is like I know you said this is a backdrop really for yeah. the benefit of this, but I don't do that anywhere in I my mean, house. I, 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 I would not unless I had a reason to either. The things that I have up are my consoles. That's my display. Um, that's the thing that I guess I get that feeling from the layout that's got all of my consoles on it. Um, I mean, you mentioned the clothing. I'm going to counter that a little bit by saying I have to wear something and that Magic Up t-shirt is fucking cool. No, it's all right, Wayne. You <laughs> can come on naked. We we'd, we'd, <laughs> we might even prefer it. Someone might. <laughs> but like, I can, t- like, like, I stand f- I stand in favour of the Magic Card t-shirt. Oh man, I was like, hoping you were going to say you stand in favour of Wayne being naked. Oh, okay. Uh, right. And, and no, I prefer him dressed as Knuckles. We've established this on the podcast. Um, <laughs> I'm always Sonic. Um, but uh, basically... Who's Tails? Well, there's this position open, actually, if you're interested. I'm all right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, so... But like, I think, though, I think all game merch is linked. But I mean, like, the actual question seems to be asking much more about how we consume our, like, you know, our special editions of said games, right? Like the physical items, like with Tomb Raider, like I I bought the special edition of Tomb Raider, and like I don't I don't know what these physical items are. I don't I don't seem to have any physical items that came with mine, and it was quite expensive. So I'm a bit sad about that. If there was the physical items going, I have made a rule for myself that I will n- never spend over a hundred pounds on a game which like prizes me out of any sort of statue universe. I'm much more comfortable around the 60 pound mark where you get a really nice book, usually a soundtrack. Cause I like those. Yeah. That starts to sound and an art book. Like that sounds like that's my perfect edition. I have a really hard time spending more than 40 pounds on any game. And I mean, like actually what, what's happened through me going through a short period of buying special editions of things is now, I um, I mean, like, I mean, when you said the thing that makes your collection is actually having those consoles on display, I don't even care for that. Like, I literally just want to be able to play the games. Now, I think there is a nice thing about having the media that you own or that you um, that you watch that you play in a physical form, so you can lend it to people. Like, that's actually a a thing that you don't get in the place where I own most of my video games now, which is in the digital space. Uh, except there is a little bit of a thing that you can do with your Steam library of having like Steam family and things like that, which definitely helps. But when it comes down to it, I would rather have all of that stuff accessible rather than visible. And I don't really give that much of a damn. 
Um, I think that there are occasions where it is nice to have that aesthetic to be able to show people what is in your collection rather than having to list it off one by one by one. But for the most part, I don't feel that I need to you, show people video games. That would be a format spreadsheet though, wouldn't it? Yeah, literally, I have that. <laughs> See, I have the physical collection and one of those. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like I, yeah, like in in my personal experience, my personal value of video games is not in showing people the parts of video games that I own. It is the experience of playing them, being able to have discussions about that, those experiences, like that's where I gain all of my worth. So, or all of my worth from video games. So yeah, like I'm I'm not fussed about collectible stuff anymore. Yeah, but also one of the big things that's, that, that's like a bit different is I'm used to it because I like, when it comes to retro, I don't really have a choice often. Mm-hmm. Indeed. You know, like I can't go to Steam and buy Robo Pit. I like, you know, I have to go on the internet and find an eBay man that's had had it, then I have to give him my soul and seventy five quid, and then he'll give me a copy of Robo Pit. I haven't spent that much money on Robo Pit. That's not, that's not a thing that's happening. But that's a shame. Yeah, I'm, so, I, I'd quite like to play Robo Pit again. So would I. I like. I haven't actually checked, but like I'm eyeing it up for, for a little there bit. Is, of a there is there is a broader Pit. question though that we've that we haven't really discussed that much here, which is not our personal like feeling about collectibles and video games, but the general vibe like do is do you think that people are losing the value of the game that they're actually interested in because of all of the rest of the late stage capitalism bollocks that's building up around it controversial opinion that i hold yeah i think buy a video game yeah i really respect the video games that sell you the game and then say if you are in you can have 150 quid and then we'll sell you what would be the ultimate edition of it. Yeah, like it's just all the superfluous stuff. So you don't have to buy into that off the flip. Yeah, like you just, you you buy the game first, you play the game, then you see if, I, the first one I remember is Wolfenstein. Do you want an articulated one of those Panzerhound things? Like if you want one of those, like, and you like it that much, then give us 140 quid and we'll give you all of that gobbins in a big box and we'll send it to you. And I, to be honest, people can spend what they want with their money. I think it's a bit, I think that kind of, I've got a real problem with the limited, like that limited vibe, you know, where it's like, if you don't have this, you, you are Nintendo rubbish. Vibe. I mean, some people only value things because they are rare. They, some people don't so that's the only way that they can get some of this tat out the door you know, some, it's like oh this is a sack of shit but there's only 25 of them so it will be my sack of shit <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's probably I, I mean actually I've got a video gotta get game, those ultra rares I've got yeah I've got a video game analogy on this actually um, from Pokemon Go because they're, um, they've for this month, they've moved Mewtwo from EX Raids, which are quite a ball ache to get into and qualify for and do, to Standard Raids, which are much less of a ball ache. Now, they've been in EX Raids for about eight months or so. Like, this is a while they've been about. And people are complaining because it, they feel like it devalues their own <laughs> acquisition. And you're sort of like, well, you've had the sort of exclusive access to it for all of this time. Is that not reward enough? You've got, it's one of the most powerful Pokemon in the game. Is that enough? But for some people, no, the fact that other people don't have it is literally the only thing that makes them tick. And so, sort of, I don't know, like diamonds, not very useful, kind of rare, (laughs) worth a lot. Oh no, but they're not, are they? That's the thing. What is it? They are artificially suppressed. Oh yeah, no, you're right. There's, there's shitloads of them. So, there. so what we're talking about suppressed. here is just economics. One of the rare, one of the rare cases where the slave labour's whip to not quite extract as much. <laughs> Stop working so hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not actually funny. No. <laughs> I know. I was quite proud of it. <laughs> I mean, not not so what it goes. Not now, now, that we've <laughs> now, now that we've created Mewtwo to blood diamonds. <laughs> Um, Should we move on to the next question? 
No, I mean, well, like, have we have we come to a consensus with this one? Or what are we, what are we saying? Are no, we, but it, but I don't. I actually don't feel that we will because I think that like there's a there's a personal valuation that's going to be different for everybody, and I think that the benefits and problems that exist within the system that is capitalism are incredibly apparent like in this question and to really get to grips and come to some sort of reasonable answer we would have to delve deep into knowledge that i do not have but i yeah. guess one thing that i do have knowledge of is if you're about to buy a shadow of the tomb raider then i would say if you've got a special Lara Croft shelf and you have lots of Lara Croft things on it then then like it will be another thing for that you know, if that's what's going on. But if that isn't what's going on, I would say that m- maybe don't, because it's probably the least good one of those free video games. So is that that is a bit of an answer to a bit of that question. Yeah, right? I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's a whole other bit as well that I didn't do about... Which I actually, I'm going to s- sit right off because we haven't got long enough and we've got another okay, question. Okay, go on, go on. So I'm going to just jump straight into the other question. Yep. Which, apologies, John Joe, I am going to paraphrase. If you're on the Discord, you can read it in our podcast questions um, thread. Um, but it's about um, the idea of difficulty in video games and as an achievement. Um, so there's a good story about um, elements of God of War. Um, and how playing it on a really hard difficulty occasionally turns into simply a bit of a grind, a bit of a chug, um, rather than actually being enjoyable. And it was sort of like, uh, and so it came to the point of, is this is this worth doing, basically? Uh, do I need it to sort of like plat the game or get a trophy or 100% it, etc.? And the answer is no. And the answer is no. Um and so basically like the the i the, the 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 sort of key gist of the question is does difficult do harder difficulty levels need a reward need something associated with them to be worth playing um can they lead to negative gaming exp- um experiences regardless of whether or not there is a reward for it and um is there a reward outside of the game basically beyond the achievements etc so i'm curious to see if we agree here joe so go on what do you think so i believe that again we're entering into a personal taste question so i buy a video game i crank it up to its hardest difficulty that's what i do i am one of those wrong ones yeah but wayne you'll testify i've been doing it for years because the default difficulty for video games was hard when we started like that was that was it there wasn't another option it was just like back when ninja gaiden was called shadow warrior on the nes like you turn that on and it was hardness a million and that was just how things were and like that was fine so like can you step up or are you a terrible human yeah and, and <laughs> like you know i get beaten by games quite a lot like and that's fine but like i enjoy playing them on their hardest difficulty because it brings me a lot so I believe that hard difficulty is its own reward. Now, I think that if you are, if you're that personality type, then that's fine. I think if you are someone that is hunting for a reward who doesn't want hard without one, then you're the wrong person for hard mode. Yeah. That's, that's not. So I wouldn't agree a hundred percent, but I think in most circumstances, you're correct. I think that actually, I mean, I also like to, I like to play a game at a, generally at a hard difficulty because I tend to feel that the challenge that is on offer there is the one I'm going to have more fun playing, that I enjoy having to overcome like whatever challenges there are in in that video game. In God of War, there were definitely parts of it that were a real struggle, but there was a wonderful thing it actually it felt really good trying to sort of find my way around those particular like bumps in the difficulty curve of the game and i absolutely fucking love the fact that you do not gain any trophies or achievements or anything for doing that right like the fact that if you are not if your if your skills at the game or not such that you feel that you are capable of playing or actually just that you wouldn't have as much fun 
playing it at that difficulty. You don't have to, to gain everything from it. But if you are the person that does gain more from it, you can. Like that, that feels like the way it should be to me. That feels like the way it should be to me. So I don't play automatically stick games up on their hardest level because for the most part, games that have a difficulty setting, I'm not good enough at. That's a partic- but that's the thing, that's a particular kind of game, Wayne, because also, though, you are one of the few people that I know that I actually believe to be a master of a few games. Yes, no, I am. And this is why I say games that have a difficulty setting. So I really enjoy very difficult games. But what I tend to enjoy when games are hard is a difficulty curve or a progression. Celeste is an, a good recent example of this. And Trackmania is another one. Games that become infuriatingly, taxingly hard as a result of sort of going through challenges and bettering your skills as you go on. If uh, games that have a difficulty selection in them tend to be ones where there is some kind of journey, some kind of experience rather than simply the challenge itself. Um, When it's um, the other types of games that the challenge is is the game itself that is the journey the challenge is the journey these ones have something else outside them and then what i'll tend to do is i'll what i found is like hard rather than hardest hard if um if there's one harder than that or medium if there isn't if it's just like an easy medium hard then i'll go for the medium setting work out after a little while how much i'm dying and if it's frequent enough games do need to be a challenge to be rewarding but I think that if I'm beating myself up or if I'm getting beaten up and bashed over the head by it, then um, then it's a bit much. So like when I first played The Last of Us, I played the it on normal. The perfect example. I played it on normal. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really wanted the experience. It was the story. That was what I was there for. But I did want it to be at times challenging. And it was because that's not my genre. Um, really, it's not the games that I am really good at. When I came back and played it again when it was re-released on PS4, because obviously, I then set it up to hard because I played it for on the easier difficulty. And I now needed that challenge for it to remain engaging in the gameplay elements. So I think, I mean, to bring up The Last of Us, I think that the whole experience of that game is one of of struggle right like you're supposed to feel like you are just barely making it through right and i think that there are a lot of people that played that game on normal because it's the default that could have played it on hard i mean there's four difficulties in there so there's hard and then there's survivor yeah and people people that should have pl- been playing on hard to get the most out of it just defaultly play every game on normal and therefore felt like they had a wealth of ammunition and felt that like combat scenarios weren't difficult and therefore didn't get to feel the what was on offer in the game. And then to go back to a phrase that we've used earlier in this podcast, they felt ludonarrative dissonance because they were like, this game is telling me I'm having a really difficult time and I'm just running up on guys and shooting them and then finding bullets everywhere. I didn't. I'm not, I'm, I wasn't very good at it. I was, I was, you guys saw me play factions after finishing it. I was not good at that game when none, I first played it. Were, but we got there. Um, <laughs> no, but, but I, no, like, I, so, I'm, I am. I am not talking about you, though. No, I am. I, know, I am but, talking about the the general gaming public and the things I, think, I heard from them. I think, like, what? Yeah, there there will be people that do that by default, and it is a pro, It is worth t- spending the time to explore difficulties to find the appropriate challenge. But. I, I I don't I think that coming from it from a sort of like smack it up I, I think you can and I have I would rather start a game a little bit easier and ramp it up if possible mm. if you can change the difficulty in game than the other way around because I may well bounce off of a game if I find it's beating me up too much in so the early stages that then perhaps bolsters the argument of the fact that there shouldn't be rewards based on that difficulty because if you have to play the game through as you normally do if there's an achievement there, all on the same difficulty, all on the higher difficulty to get it, then that's going to stop people changing that difficulty, turning it up to match the amount of challenge that is appropriate for them. So... Uh, Yeah, I mean, like, I think, though, like, when you're laying it out like that, I think for me it's obvious is, you know, like, how maybe achievements and trophies should not be linked to multiplayer? Mm Mm-hmm maybe difficulty is another one that just needs to go so people can craft their own experiences without feeling that they're missing out that doesn't mean that you can't put like some fucking super gnarly hard boss in the end of your game I'm going to actually switch I I mean I 
like a trophy. But hell, if you're not good enough to get it, it's a difficult one to earn. You just have to accept you didn't get it. I think on diff- a difficulty a difficulty trophy is perfectly valid. I don't have all of them. I have I've platted I don't think anything because a lot of games have this. Play it on a super hard difficulty and I'm like, I'm not good enough. Man, I've never and managed I, to beat Zyko and wipe out. And and I, I accept it and move on. I'm not good enough. That's fine. If you want it, get better. <laughs> get good. Oh, you heard it here. Wayne says get good. <laughs> um uh uh yeah i mean i do but again but even if it but if you have to play through the whole game on the hardest difficulty to get that achievement then if you don't have the time to play through the game and you do turn it up to the hardest difficulty and you were good enough and you didn't play it on the hardest difficulty for the first level then you're not gonna fucking get it and fuck you fucking mass effect for not having me let me have that achievement because your goddamn difficulty kept changing on me and i had to keep change putting it up so that i had the right amount of challenge and i'm still pissed off about that to this day but it do- that was where bioware really started to slip <laughs> <laughs> like i say I, I, like you don't have to do it tomorrow I, I mean if you care enough about playing games then i don't believe that time necessarily is your concern no, right. your, your own sanity is. The, but, you know, Dan's not here to defend himself, so he'll just have to deal with that. you got to watch out for the trophy lords, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you, no. you have by default, because a lot of the things that you have to do to plat a game are beyond. Can I They're, be honest? There's much more offensive things that they ask you to do than play, like fucking collectibles. Or, yeah, exactly. Or collectibles or grind crafting materials for 700 years. Like there are these common ones. Grind craft. Yeah. That sounds this like is, an excellent name of the game. Point. There's a lot more onerous things in terms of time consideration. So playing the game for a second time when you're better at it at a harder difficulty certainly shouldn't be one of them. <laughs> um... What about other rewards, though? Like, I mean, achievements is one thing, but what about the other sorts of in-game rewards that you might have? I mean, I know that for The Witcher 2, for instance, there was an additional difficulty that was added to it in the uh, sort of Game of the Year-ish edition where there were extra items thrown in there as well. Like, do you think that is a sensible thing to, to put into the mix? Or do you think that's actually sort of taking away from the experience from everyone else in a certain way? Resident Evil 4. Make a great single player campaign that's super rewarding. And then when you get to the end of it and you finish it, give me a super hard, getting progressively harder arcade mode that refines all of those skills that I have learned and package it into something like Mercenaries. And then what you've got is something that's worthwhile in game content. Yeah, you've got something new that's going to push those those skills that I've learned to the absolute fucking limit, make me feel like a boss that like is kind of outside of the context of the crafted narrative experience. You know, that's a reward. Can you do that for every game though? No, you can do similar things. Like, for example, like... <sighs> Super Hexagon, like I mean, but Super Hexagon, just, Super Hexagon just is that. Yeah, no, but yeah, but it, but like that is the game, yeah. Like it's like it's that progressive curve, like what you're talking about. You're like Wayne, and it's and I think that that stuff. I think, but like maybe being more aware of it actually is. I thought maybe that's the biggest crime is how how throwaway often these harder modes are. You know, like, because, like, I believe that Last of Us difficulties doesn't really start popping for me till you get to Survivor, where they take away hearing. Because for me, that is ludonarrative dissonance, being able to see through a motherfucking wall but because I can really, hear. But there is a really important thing, I know. There, which is, yeah, if people aren't, yeah, I do have difficulty hearing. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, I know. You always make me feel bad about it, and you always make me because I'm not thinking about those things when I say them, and then you always say them, and then I feel like a terrible person because I because I, I didn't think of that. So <laughs> so well done. But unfortunately, as someone who's lucky enough to have their hearing, I like. I mean, you agree with this point also, though, don't you? That you play, you prefer it without. Oh no, Survivor's the fucking one. Yeah, exactly. I think you need to be set up for it though, right? In the same way as like Hellblade, you you want to be having headphones on. 
ideally to get an idea of the spatial mm-hmm. feeling I mean, of it's it. Fucking and Last of Us. So Last, like, of, last of Us is the last us... game I like, was the last game I ever mastered. So I just now know where everyone is in it. Yeah, but <laughs> then, know? then, but that's the other thing in the game. You don't have memory of those scenarios either, which is you know would make Survivor, I guess, that little bit easier with not having hearing. Yeah, I think. So I think it's actually really interesting when you introduce sort of ideas of accessibility into difficulty though. And I mean, like Celeste is, is a premier example of how to do that with like it's assist mode that you can decide to turn on if you want and doesn't stop you getting any of the achievements, doesn't stop you being able to access any of the game. But it does mean that depending on which sort of cheat-ish modes you decide to employ, like it will make the game a lot easier and like kudos to it for that like the the i mentioned this on pod on the podcast before but the fact that you can make it so that you either have extra jumps or you don't die when you hit things that would damage you normally or that you're just completely invincible and to change the speed at which the game goes means that it ends up making it so that people who for whatever reason might not be able to access as much of the game have a way to do that so they don't feel that they are being shuttered out by the incredible difficulty that the game gets to and i think that's great and i think that in terms of difficulty in terms of pitching that challenge right like you i feel like i gain more from throwing myself against something that's really difficult but if for whatever reason like if that's not fun or it's not possible, giving people another choice is really fucking important. So yeah, like I would like it if everybody could access all of what a video game is. That is necessarily going to be impossible, but allowing people to access as much of it as possible is something that designers can kind of keep in mind. And I think that a lot of this concept of sort of getting things off at harder difficulties, rewarding people for being able to play the games on harder difficulties is actually stopping other people from being able to access all of the game that they might be able to get to. Yeah, it depends what you're talking about with rewards though. It I mean does. there are there are limited limited circumstances where you get something else that you can play. Very, very limited circumstances where you can get something else you can play. And in a way that's no Hard, that that's often no different even then from like a hard to access sort of like bonus area because celeste like the majority of us couldn't get all of the hearts and stuff anyway because they're nightmarish all of the b-sides and it's fucking great that, yeah no and that's a great and that's a good <laughs> actually, thing actually i've got that's most of the b-sides we, i haven't finished any of no 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 what i mean is do them but that's <laughs> something that makes that's something that actually makes the game kind of appealing mm-hmm. in a way i don't think that it's necessarily a bad a bad thing to have to have rewards for that but i mean for certainly for trophies i don't i don't, i guess what what my my personal approach is coming from it from like yeah trophies is just trophies in it like that's kind of the summary for me for that part that's a it's a difficult one do you know what i kind of miss that's kind of gone just whilst we're talking about difficulty do you know what i haven't seen in a long time you know you're like playing a video game and you're playing a video game and you're, and you're dying quite a lot i think the first time i ever encountered this was devil may cry when you were fighting the the Nilo Angelo guy that also had a sword and looked a bit like Dante. Yeah, like he beat me over and over and over again. And then the game was like, hey, mate, you, you're all right. You're, you, you're I all right. That. I hate that. Are you, are you having a hard time? Because if you are like, yeah, you turn the difficulty down. It's I re- right. No, but I hate that, right? Because that's like that's like I'm I'm fine with dying, but the second you ask me that, I'm, it's like it's like a backhand to the face. Yeah, it's like, it's like you got, you're not you, good enough. Can you, can you, <laughs> no, but like because that's the thing is, I think actually in Devil May Cry, the way that they presented it is kind of all right. I think in Ninja Gaiden, it's not on. Where they're I, like, "Are you a fucking dog?" Like literally, it's like, "Are you a ninja dog? Would you like to play it on dog mode for fucking <laughs> garbage people?" <laughs> and you're like, and you're like, "No, Ninja Gaiden, I'm not a dog." It actually doesn't matter to me. If it says it more nicely, it feels more patronizing. No, if, it's like, mean, if it's like, oh, you're all right. Is, is this, can you, maybe, maybe this is a little bit too tough for you. I'm like, fuck you. I can fucking take this on. What, what Wolfenstein does is it simply reminds you that the difficulty can be changed. That, that is that is actually just as bad for me. No, that no. Is that's honestly just that's, as bad. That, that's fine. It's sort of like once in a while it comes up and it's like, 
the difficulty can be changed at any time just as one of the tool tips when you're on a loading screen and it's like oh yeah I'm not fucking doing it though I've chosen my path now <laughs> <laughs> yeah nah, I just no I don't ever want to be reminded because if if I if I am reminded even, even if it's something that's just happening as as part of the the standard sort of tooltip loading screen shenanigans of the video game like it feels like it's telling me that I'm not good enough and and apparently a lot of my ego is tied up in that <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can get you on the couch later if you want. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a wider issue. It's called a sofa. We're not American. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure this is like this, the psychiatrist couch. I'm sure they don't call it the psychiatrist sofa. Well, they bloody I'm pretty shoes. sure, in fact, I've never heard that phrase ever. Well, this is a psychiatrist no, no, sofa. No, no, it's yeah. a chaise lounge. It is a chaise lounge. He's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so ordinal numbers. No, <laughs> look, let's call it a fucking. Okay, pod. yeah, right. Like we've definitely descended into. Nonsense. Thanks everyone for writing in. I've I've definitely drunk too much. Um, so um, <laughs> this was episode eighty six of Taste My Game Face. If you've enjoyed listening to us up until maybe the last ten minutes or so before we started really talking shite, um, then please, you know, do the reviewing thing. Give us give us more than three stars wherever you like, um, or just don't give us less. If you're gonna give us less. <laughs> <laughs> don't give us a review. Let's you know what? bargain. Let's do the, the sign off. <laughs> no, no, no. I've got this. I've got this. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, if you do want to um, send any um, sort of questions or comments, you can do so to uh, taste my game face at gmail.com or you can follow the links at uh, taste my game face.com slash contacts to get to either our Discord, our Twitter, our YouTube, or anywhere else that you can find us on the internet. Um, if you want to get involved in the uh, Twitter, the Twitters that uh, Wayne has been in charge of for a little while. Yeah, don't remind me. <laughs> Okay, then, <laughs> then then don't apparently. <laughs> um, no, I, I do want to. I do want to just accentuate what Joe said. Thank you. As you can see, we do actually. You know, we enjoy having the questions to discuss on the show. So if you do have any thoughts or feelings or whatever that you want us to talk about, then keep them to yourself. <laughs> what the fuck, man? <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> it's been fun. I don't even know anymore. <laughs> Taste my game fix.